Chapter 8 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 8 Fox Glass here continued. Return to camp. Unpleasant surprise. Result. Weckus. Back to Ryan's. Remarks on the glacier. To return in such a dense fog was by no means easy, especially as I could not think of descending the rotten rocks up which I had come in the morning, for even had it been possible to find a route, the falling stones would have been too risky. Fortunately, my bump of locality is strong and by dint of dropping, sliding, and scrambling over steep faces of unpleasantly smooth rocks and slippery grass, I managed to hit off the point to a nicety at which to cross the ice. On reaching the south bank and skirting the small icefall, the few minutes' work amongst the crevasses gave some trouble in the fog. It is no easy matter to travel down a glass here, even when one knows it well, in such a dense white mist but to find a good route after only once traversing it was rather difficult business. After travelling till 5 p.m., it seemed that I had gone far enough to have reached the point where I first took the ice in the morning. There are no large stones on the glacier by which to guide one's course, so it was not surprising to find, on turning towards the bank, that I had gone about one hundred yards too far, and was abreast of the precipice under the cone rock. Another half hour, however, saw me on my way to the camp, and though wet to the skin, decidedly pleased at being well out of an awkward position, and looking forward to dry clothes, good fire, and snug camp. Hurrying along in the deluge of rain, which had set in, splashing down the creek and clambering over the boulders, I arrived at the camp about ten minutes before dark. Instead of my comfortable little shelter and dry clothes, I found only a wreck. The batwing and a quarter of the fly had been burnt, the little canvas bags of food and the pea rifle, which usually hung on the ridge pole under the fly, were lying scorched on the ground. In one corner a heap of ashes, a button or two, and a large hole in the scrub bedding were all that remained of my dry clothes. This was the crowning disaster of an unlucky expedition. A man familiar with his Virgil would probably have consoled himself by saying, For sen et he olum meminis ajuvabit. I fear, however, that I made some other remark, not in Latin, and did not think of Virgil till afterwards. With only a few minutes of twilight to work in, I commenced to fix up some sort of shelter out of the remains in which to pass the night. A more weatherproof shelter would have to be left till the morning in spite of the heavy rain. The fly I pitched as we had had it on the bow for glass here, and one end was blocked to a height of two feet with a few branches. This was all that could be done that night and having kindled a fire and put the billy on to boil, I sat down to see what remained out of the wreck. The first things to be missed were the candles, which had of course been burnt, and their loss at once put an end to further investigation till daylight. Fortunately, I had a few matches in my pocket, and could manage with care to hold out for a few days as far as they were concerned. Having had something to eat, and some half-burnt tea without sugar to drink, I put on kilts, i.e. wrapped the blanket round me, and proceeded to dry my clothes. By ten o'clock some of the garments were fairly dry. So, thoroughly tired after the long day, I rolled myself in the blanket, and in spite of the storm soon forgot this miserable world in a sound sleep. However long or hard a day's work has been, we cannot sit down and have a spell on returning to camp at night, because possibly there is firewood to gather, bread to bake, and a meal to cook. Indeed, Sometimes a meal has to be found with a pea rifle. It would be to either of us a luxury beyond belief to have a third man whom we could occasionally leave in camp and to find things ready on our return in the evening. The extra work in the evening is far harder than one would imagine. Even supposing a permanent third member to the party was impossible, it would have made our work considerably quicker and less trying had we been given a man who could carry a good load of provisions for two or three days from habitation and then be sent back. This would give us a good stock to fall back on and possibly save a long tramp back for food or else a period of starvation. It is a trial to one's powers to have to do mental work and heavy packing at the same time in such terribly broken country and for a prolonged season of seven or eight months. The authorities, however, did not consider it necessary, not having any idea of what rough work it really was, 
In fact, on one occasion when mention was made of the necessity of carrying heavy loads, someone asked, Why do you not employ a spring dray or pack horse? Imagine a spring dray over fifty-foot boulders, or along a narrow arete. It was often difficult to get the dog over the country. The driving rain and high wind whistling under the fly woke me early, and at daylight I set to work to build a more satisfactory shelter. The creeks and rivers were in flood and uncrossable, so there was every prospect of two days' delay before I could get away. It did not take long to put up two good windbreaks, with branches and ferns at each end of the fly, and to generally fix up a shelter in which I was as happy as a sandboy, in spite of the storm. There was now time to examine the effects of the fire, which had been very erratic. In the first place, it is hard to explain why the fly had not been totally destroyed, for it was only pitched six inches above the batwing. It would seem impossible for the latter to burn from the bottom so completely as it had, without setting fire to the fly, which is the most inflammable portion of the camp, owing to the fire always keeping it dry. At each end of the batwing we have two pockets, a large one for field books, etc., and a small one for watch matches and so forth. In the two large ones I had left some photographic plates, notebooks, and a pound of candles. The books and plate boxes were charred a little, and the candles had disappeared. In one of the smaller pockets were a box of fifty pea rifle cartridges and two boxes of matches. The cartridges were unhurt, while one box of matches had exploded and the other only melted in a solid mass. On the bedding, my dry clothes and tobacco were in one corner, and within a foot of them the blanket with the half-plate camera and some newspapers on it. Of these, the clothes and tobacco had gone absolutely, leaving a hole burnt to the ground in the scrub where we slept. The other heap was untouched, except the papers on the camera, which were burnt to an ash. Douglas has only once been burnt out, and his experience is the same as that of others, namely, that nothing escapes. My misfortune was, therefore, not as bad as it might have been, and there was good cause to be thankful that some provisions were still left since my retreat was cut off. Shelter was not of so much importance, because had all the canvas been destroyed, I could have knocked up a mai mai of bark and ferns in an hour. It is impossible to say how the fire originated, unless I had left the candle burning when leaving camp at dawn, in which case, no doubt, one of the wekas had pulled it over while looking for buttons or some such digestible food. The white candle would be an irresistible temptation. After all, it is of little consequence how the thing happened. The fact remained that I had to sit and sigh in idleness for three days. Whilst turning out the contents of one of my pockets, I came across a scrap of an old world, on which was a most appropriate poem entitled, Every Hour Has Its End. This fact is often too true to dispute, but was open to argument under the present circumstances. With nothing to read and very little to smoke, the hours appeared to have at least one hundred minutes. The family of Wekas, which had taken possession of the camp, were very welcome, and I was able to watch their mode of procedure when dissolving partnership for the time being. As already stated, when the male bird thinks he has done his share in the education and bringing up of the family, he dissolves partnership. If in a good locality for food, he drives his mate and young ones away, but if in a poor locality he departs to happier hunting grounds himself. The parent birds, while rearing their young, hardly eat anything themselves, and grow as poor as a church mouse, everything they find is carried to the youngsters. When a pair has only one chick, it is very ludicrous to see them rushing up to it and jostling one another in their eagerness to give it a piece of bacon or bread, and sometimes asking it to try a piece of jam tin or tempting it with a choice copper cartridge case. The parent finds some such rubbish, and rushes off to the overfed fledgling, which is sitting and squeaking under a fern, and holds the tempting morsel out in its beak. The old one looks sideways at it, as much as to say, so good, while the youngster, having got it successfully down, sits with ruffled feathers, and looks at the world in general, as if it would say, that old food will be the death of me one of these days. The first intimation I had that the pair at camp were going to dissolve partnership was when I threw out a piece of bread one morning. Paterfamilius, instead of passing it to one of the chickens, swallowed it himself, while the rest of the family looked on reproachfully and seemed to know they must look out for squalls. After the old boy had got all he could, he suddenly turned round and attacked his wife, 
and then the male youngster, the female chick having wisely disappeared, pro tem. When I saw he was going to drive the family away and stay at the camp to enjoy all the good things himself, I decided to put a stop to his little game and gave him a rifle bullet to digest. He made a capital stew, and a sorrowing family thoroughly enjoyed his remains. The next day, Mrs. Wecca found the two half-grown chickens rather a large order. In the first place, they both tried to shelter themselves under her from the rain, which upset her mentally and physically, and secondly, the task of feeding them was too much for her. She therefore proceeded to drive away Master Wecca. That young gentleman, however, was not going to leave his family home without a struggle, and seeing his sister still petted and fed, he used to give her a good peck when the old hen was not looking, and then run for his life before she caught him. I again interfered in the proceedings, and by dint of some coaxing, persuaded Master Wecca to come on to the bedding in the shelter, where he would eat from my hand. By degrees he gained confidence, and came in without fear, having a good feed, while the old hen remained outside waiting for him. On finishing the meal he used to dodge about inside, trying to make his escape, and the old bird dodged about outside to cut him off. I would then throw a piece of bread away into the bush, and while she went after it, the youngster would slip out and run for dear life, rolling his more favoured sister in the mud on the way. On the tenth, the weather cleared and gave me an opportunity to go down to Ryan's hut. Therefore, leaving my friends to settle their own family affairs, I rolled up my goods and started down the river, meeting Douglas and Betsy, who were coming up to join me. However, my ankle was still weak and wanted a rest, so we went back to the hut to make a new batwing and generally repair damages. It required another ten days' work to map the glacier, so we returned on the 16th and took the camp three-quarters of a mile further up the creek than my first camp, intending to make some observations as to motion, etc., and complete the map of the valley. Fate seemed to be against us on this glacier, for out of the thirteen days away from Ryan's hut, we had only two fine ones, and those were the day we came up to camp and the day we returned to Ryan's. We were, however, able to make a more thorough exploration of the Fox and Victoria glaciers below the Neve and take a few more bearings. On the 29th, our stores had come to an end, so the weather cleared and the sun shone out beautifully, but one or two snowfalls had taken place during the previous week, warning us that winter was approaching and that if we intended to reach the head of Cook's River and the La Perouse Glacier, we must do so at once and waste no more time over the Fox Glacier. In any case, there was little left to be done there, while Cook River might prove troublesome, and there was a danger of further snow preventing our expedition. Consequently, we packed up and carried our loads back to Ryan's hut. The Fox Glacier is more attractive than many places much advertised and visited. It certainly has not nearly such a grand terminal face as the Franz Joseph, but it is in every other way superior for tourists. It is quite as easy of access, it has fine surroundings, and there are hot springs within a mile of it. But the chief attraction to my mind is that anyone with ordinary care can go a mile or so along the ice, or three miles along the south bank, on the old lateral moraines. This would enable many who have never seen a glacier to gain some idea of an icefall at close quarters, for though not so fine as that of its neighbor, the icefall of the fox is by no means a poor one. An easy and safe expedition could be made to the Chancellor Ridge, from which a grand view of the great peaks and the Neve can be gained. If the government desired to open up the district, a track could be taken up to the glacier, and even along its south bank, at a small cost and a hut placed on the Chancellor. To go even a short distance on to the Franz Joseph Glacier with safety would require an expert at ice work. There are many interesting features on the Fox Glacier, which are more marked than on other ice streams in New Zealand. On no other glacier in the Southern Alps is the veined structure of the ice so apparent. In fact, I have never seen such a fine example of this anywhere. The ice is laminated to such an extent, just above the Cone Rock, that it resembles a ploughed field, and the furrows being from six inches to a foot in depth, and the same distance apart in places, are very troublesome to walk over. The lamination does not run in one direction, and though most of the lines are longitudinal, they sometimes curve gracefully toward the margin of the ice. Wherever a crevasse occurs, the effect is beautiful, and the lines can be seen descending perpendicularly as far as there is light to see. 
Another peculiarity on the fox is the number of moulins, or funnels in the ice. Abreast of and above the cone rock, they are most noticeable, and though not as fine as many I have seen elsewhere, they are very good specimens, from six to ten feet across at the top, and two or three feet a little lower down. For roche this valley does not equal the Franz Joseph, but has a splendid example of a great isolated rock in the cone. The northern bank, too, from the terminal face to the icefall, presents a good instance of steep faces of rock abraded by glacier action. Lateral moraines of various ages can be examined on the south side of the valley, and large erratic blocks found on the top of the cone rock. The individual points of interest may be surpassed, with the exception of the first mention, in other localities, but nowhere else in New Zealand can they be seen to such perfection, collected in one valley, easy to reach, and easy to inspect and examine, owing to the smooth surface of the glacier. In addition to this, there is the fact of still more peculiar interest, namely, a glacier in approximate latitude, 43 degrees, 29 minutes, 30 seconds south, descending over nine miles to 670 feet above sea level, within 10 miles of the beach. This can also be said of the Franz Joseph, but it does not at the same time possess all the other interesting features mentioned above, nor is it so easy to travel on. The very easy traveling and unbroken surface of the Fox Glacier shows, I imagine, that the ice is of greater depth than that of the Franz Joseph. It may be that this smoothness is due to the bed of the valley having fewer obstructions. That there are several rocky obstacles under the ice of the latter cannot, I think, be doubted, and accounts for the heaving appearance which the ice of that glacier has. I am not aware that the old saying, still waters run deep, can be applied to a glacier, but it appears to me that the Fox Glacier must be of considerable depth, or it would not flow down as steeply as it does without having a rougher and more broken surface. At the terminal face, the ice pushes its way under the level of the river bed. In several places, holes in the gravel, caused by subsidence due to the melting ice, can be seen towards the end of the summer. The water, too, does not come out in an ordinary manner, but bubbles up like a great spring to a height of three feet in ordinary weather and five or six feet during rain. This shows that the streams which flow under the ice are considerably below the riverbed level when they reach the terminal face, and on being released from the ice rush up to the surface with great force. In July 1894, Douglas and Mr. Wilson paid a brief visit to the glacier, and the former noticed a very marked change in the ice. As will be seen in a later chapter, we anticipate a decided winter advance in the Franz Joseph Glacier and were disappointed to find that a retreat only was evident. The fact of these two glaciers descending to such a low altitude would lead one to expect a greater proportional winter motion than is to be found on higher glaciers, for the melting would be less by a great deal than in the summer, and yet the rapid descent and frequent rain would cause a movement greater in comparison to the melting than we should find in the hotter months. This was fully borne out in the case of the Fox Glacier, for Douglas found some of my flags, which had been as usual visible from each other, invisible from points where originally they could be seen owing to the ice having banked up considerably. Also, on two rocky points or capes on the north side, the ice had completely covered a large portion of rock visible in the summer. I do not know why this advance or increase was visible on the Fox Glacier, while on its neighbor a general decrease was found. It may be, and probably is, due to the different aspect of the two valleys. This one faces slightly north of west, and therefore loses the winter sun for many hours in the day on its lower portion, while the Franz Joseph faces due north and receives the whole heat of the day. Again, this glacier has the steep hillsides on the sunny side, while the other has them on the opposite side. When reliable observations as to the motion of the ice are taken, we shall probably find a much higher rate of flow on the Franz Joseph than on the Fox Glacier. An unnamed peak, generally confused with Hedinger from the west coast, and not visible except from high points on the eastern ranges, stands at the head of the Fox, and is the most prominent summit from the terminal face. This I have seen from several different points, and always held that it is distinct from Hedinger. When Fitzgerald made his ascent of the latter, he left a large cairn on the summit, and he and I distinctly saw this from the Fritz Glacier when we were there during the next season. 
I had explained my contention to him before we started, and we therefore made a point of deciding the question. Since Hattinger was first named from the Tasman, and the name has been put on the wrong peak by the West Coast Department, it should be retained on the summit seen from the eastern side. I have generally called this unnamed peak the Horn, for it is a distinct horn from the West Coast, De La Beche, and Darwin. Hedinger proper does not show as a peak at all from the Fox Glacier, though one of the finest as seen from the Tasman. The first impression I received on looking at the surroundings of the Fox Neve was that peaks rising from it would be most troublesome to climb from this side, but the fog cut off my view so soon that the mistake was excusable. Since then, however, a second visit has shown that so far from being more difficult, they would seem to be easier on this side than from the Tasman. From the Chancellor Ridge, the Horn, Glacier Peak, and Hedinger are all accessible, as also are the chief peaks of the Bismarck Range. Good passes may be found between Mount Tasman and Mount Host, also between the latter and Hedinger. In fact, so many expeditions of interest are to be made from here that I hope it will not be many years before we see a good hut placed on the Chancellor. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Nine, Cook River, Main Branch. Rough work, large boulders, Castle Rock, Rata trees, Shelf Camp, bad weather, short commons, Cave Camp. The main branch of Cook River had been prospected for gold some years previous to our exploration but as the diggers never bring out any information concerning the topography or appearance of the country their visits are not taken into account in fact it is often quite impossible to find out how far they had been up a valley sometimes the distances they say they went would land them in reality some miles out on to the mackenzie plains i remember one fellow saying he had been eight miles along a certain ridge a fact which i doubted but on being pressed he admitted that, when he turned back, he had not reached the open grass, but he had gone quite eight miles by that time. Knowing the ridge well, I was able to say that he had not gone a mile and a quarter, as that would have brought him well up to the grass. While waiting at Ryan's, on our return from the Fox Glacier, for some provisions which were to come up from Gillespie's, the weather was perfect, but the fates were against us, and on the day the stores arrived, rain set in and prevented a start until the 29th of April. Sending our camp, stores, and instruments in three loads of fifty pounds each by pack horse to the diggers' huts, we followed on foot and crossed by the wire rope and cage. With the usual colonial freedom, we boiled the billy and had a meal in one of the huts before shouldering our loads. Such is the hospitality of the West Coast digger, that the owner of the hut would have been much hurt if we had not made ourselves at home, or had troubled to unroll the swags to get out our own provisions. Leaving about fifty pounds to bring up later, we took forty-five pounds each, and starting at one thirty p.m., travelled till nearly five o'clock without stopping, covering a distance of about four miles. This was my first experience of following up to its source, a river, which came down for any distance through the ranges. Hitherto this year, on the Waiho and Fox Rivers, the glacier and ice work predominated, and on the bow for the gorge prevented our following the actual river. In Cook River, however, we had to follow the valley, and very rough, slow work it proved. The distance covered on our first day was the longest we made during the trip, but on going over the same ground again the time was reduced considerably as we not only knew the route, but had bush tracks blazed where necessary. The first mile or two were simple enough, merely alternate beaches of small stones, i.e. stones under three feet in diameter, and short stretches of large boulders or rocky bluffs against which the river ran deep, compelling us to take to the bush. I have already described what taking to the bush involves in the way of track cutting, so need only add that when compelled to leave the open river bed, the loads had to be put down, a track blazed, round or over the obstacle, to the next piece of open going, and a return made for the loads. After the junction of Cook and Balfour Rivers, the hard work began. The valley narrows considerably, and has very steep sides, covered with dense bush and undergrowth, while below the bush, for perhaps thirty feet to the water, the valley is filled with gigantic boulders, varying in size from three feet to one hundred feet, 
and even 150 feet in diameter. These giant masses are not only lying in hopeless confusion in the bottom of the valley, but for some distance up the hillsides, where it is not too steep, boulders are found amongst and on top of which the great trees of the bush are growing. I should thoroughly enjoy a day or two travelling over such ground with nothing to carry, but it is far from amusing with forty or fifty pounds on one's back, even with one man helping the other. I really doubt whether in some places further up the river a man by himself could have managed to make any progress at all in the river bed. Often, when an impassable bluff rendered it necessary to go into the bush, one of us would slip down between two boulders into a wedge-shaped hole concealed by ferns, and after scrambling out again probably bark a shin in another hole. On finding the bush very bad going, we would decide to choose the least of two evils and go back to the open river bed. This probably necessitated a crawl under two boulders, through a small tunnel, perhaps ten or twenty feet long, with a muddy bottom or trickling water. The aperture would appear large enough to allow one to crawl through with a load, but after going a little way on hands and knees, one would have to lie down, because the load had proved too high for the tunnel. Then wriggling along, snake fashion, a little further, and the tunnel becoming smaller, the load would stick, leaving one lying face down, in mud or trickling water, fairly unable to move. The only way out of the difficulty is to allow the other man to lay hold of one by the heels, and to submit, in silence if possible, to the ignominious and uncomfortable operation of being pulled out against the grain. I do not know anything more trying to the temper than this operation, and I think it speaks volumes for Douglas and myself that the dog came back alive. After emerging from a hole backwards, with trousers above the knees, shirt ruffled up round the neck, and generally muddy, many men would want to kill something, on the same principle that some men swear at the caddy when they take their eyes off the ball at golf and come to grief. Having smoothed down the ruffled feelings and feathers, we would take off our loads and go through, passing them in front or pulling them behind. It really makes little difference whether the swag is passed in front or behind, because both methods involve sundry bumps on the head and skinned knuckles. In addition to these performances, boulders are met with, to pass which one man has to stand on the other's shoulders and swarm up a smooth round stone, then let down a rope and hoist the loads and the other man. Or the reverse is necessary in other places, followed by more crawling under boulders, and so on, ad lib. Considering these obstacles and the necessity of carrying our loads, it is not surprising that in one part of the river we were four days traversing four and a half miles in the narrowest part of the valley, climbing, crawling, sliding, scrambling, and track-cutting most of the time. In Westland there are many examples of this peculiarity, where a clump of trees are growing on a high rock, on which they will necessarily feel the want of water when they have grown to a respectable size. One of the trees in such a position sends down a long arm, which is not a root or branch, but merely a sucker, to the nearest water. All the other trees on the rock then send out similar arms, and fasten them onto the one which has first found water, and in this way the whole clump benefits and flourishes. Further evidence of this peculiar law of nature is found in cases where seedlings have been deposited on a narrow ledge on the face of a precipice. Their position is a very precarious one when they grow to any size, for a high wind will probably prove too much for them. They therefore send an arm up the face of the rock, or sometimes along it, on the same level, until it finds a crevice, and here it fastens with a wonderfully tight grip. These offshoots are found quite newly grown on trees that must be of considerable age. Immediately above our camp, the river came boiling and foaming out of a gorge, walled by sheer rock cliffs, which would compel us to blaze a track up some height and along the top of the bluff. From here, about two miles further up the river, and some height on the slopes of Ryan's Peak, we saw a rock with scrub growing on the top, which looked extraordinarily like Her Majesty's head on a jubilee coin. Instead of a crown, the scrub formed a cap, and with the snow sprinkled on the scrub, it had the appearance of a black cap, with white bands trailing out behind. This rock must be two hundred feet in height, from neck to crown, and the overhanging piece forming the nose cannot project much less than thirty feet. It is as perfect a natural bust as I have come across, as seen from this camp, and one or two points on the route past the gorge. The next day, the thirtieth, 
Douglas began to blaze a track over the bluff, while I returned to the digger's hut for the sixty-pound load we had left behind, and making a long day of it, reached camp again at dark. If the journey up to the camp had been hard work, with two of us together, it was doubly hard by myself, and the manipulation of the pack at some of the large boulders much more difficult. The down journey without the handicap of sixty pounds was made in three hours, but the return took a good five hours, chiefly owing to the number of times the load had to be roped up a boulder behind me and let down on the other side. The worst place of all to manage alone was passed far more easily than I had any right to expect, for while making up my mind how to get down without damaging my burden, I overbalanced and fell, thus solving the weighty problem without sustaining any damage. When a man has a heavy load on his back, a fall for a reasonable distance is of little consequence, for the weight always causes him to fall onto the swag, thus having a more or less soft buffer to resist the shock. On the 1st of May, we had time to look over some papers which we had received at Ryan's a week previously. The latest news in them was three weeks old, but prior to seeing them, we were nearly three months behind time. We here first read the telegram announcing Mr. Gladstone's resignation. Douglas had not been able to reach the open river beyond the gorge on the previous day, so we spent the second in taking the track on through the gorge. When two work together, we generally arranged that while one blazes the track, the other follows and carries a load, which we leave at the end of the day and return to camp. The next day, bringing up the remainder of the stores, we camp at the point where the load was left, and while one prepares a shelter, the other, if necessary, continues blazing the track. The route through the gorge had to rise some seven or eight hundred feet before we could begin to edge down again to the river. At one point, the track followed the brink of the rocky cliff for fifty yards or more, and from here, the precipice fell away sheer into the river for five hundred feet, while the opposite or eastern side was almost as precipitous. Away below was the river, looking like a small stream, now diving under and now foaming over immense boulders, while above and around us there were towering hills covered with snow to within a thousand feet of where we stood. Opposite us was the deep gorged valley of McBain's Creek, at the head of which Mount Tasman's ice-clad summit was just visible. Behind, the deep valley, the lower portion clothed with luxuriant bush, could be seen to the inflow of the Balfour River, while Craig's Range and Peak rose abruptly in the background, looking very fine in its coating of autumn snow. Two hundred feet or so above this, we were able to begin edging down, and after crossing two large creeks which fell in fine cascades over large boulders, we descended rapidly to the river, wending our way down a very steep hillside, with great erratic blocks scattered on all sides. It is wonderful that some of these stones do not roll over into the river below, so precarious do their positions appear. On reaching the river we were dismayed at the task before us. It is hardly too much to say that here we found no small boulders at all. They were all of immense size, and completely filled the bottom of the valley, the river in places disappearing underneath them. In the middle of the stream was one we named the Egg Cup Rock, a large boulder, some forty feet high and one hundred and fifty feet round, estimated, had a hollow on one side of it, like an armchair, in which rested an egg-shaped stone, about fifteen feet long and perfectly loose, evidently left by a flood. It must not be supposed that a stone of this size is too large for a flood to move. During the great storm in February, there was, as already described, a high flood on the Callery River. After the flood went down, there could be seen a large, flat-shaped boulder of some fifteen feet square, by six or seven feet thick, which had been moved from its old position in the middle of the river, and was lying on its side on some other stones, quite ten feet above, and some thirty yards from its original place. The probability is that during a flood a large amount of debris fills the bed of the rivers, owing to a slip in the valley above, and the boulder is rolled along on the top of the false bed and then the debris is scoured out again, leaving it high and dry. Whatever the means by which these large stones are moved, I feel confident that anyone who has seen a Westland River in an old man flood would credit the actual upheaval of, of any sized boulder. The power, force, and rapidity of the stream is simply appalling, and even the oldest West Coaster will watch the mad career of the river bringing down large trees, and listen to the boulders pounding and thumping along the bottom. As it was after midday and beginning to rain again, 
we left the load we had brought up under a stone and made our way back over the bluff to our camp. Some idea of this kind of work may be gained from our experience for the next three days. As the weather looked settled, and in order to lighten our loads, we had taken most of our stores ahead, leaving one day's food with the instruments, etc., in camp, expecting to be able to rejoin the stores again next day. Heavy rain, however, set in and flooded everything, so we were cut off from supplies ahead and had no chance of returning down the river. Expecting fine weather next day, we finished the remainder of the meat that evening and consequently had two days in camp with only a very limited amount of flour and rice. The remainder of our stores, namely flour, rice, oatmeal, suet, and cocoa, was above the gorge. On the evening of the second day, we had finished the tucker in camp, having made the one day's food last two days. Therefore, we were very thankful to find the sun shining next morning. Having to some extent dried our things to avoid the extra weight of carrying wet canvas, we went on through the gorge to our other load, intending to have a good meal before going any further. But as soon as we arrived, more rain set in. So, in spite of the fact that we had had nothing to eat since the previous evening, we at once began to make a shelter. After some fossicking and a good deal of talk, we found a suitable place under a large stone, which, overhanging a little, sheltered a ledge of some six feet broad by twenty feet long. Below this shelf there was a perpendicular drop of thirty feet, and then a slope to the river. Here we decided to rig our canvas in case the wind changed and drifted the rain under the rock. In camp, I always slept on the side away from the fire, which in this case we made against the rock. Thus I should have no protection against falling over the thirty feet in my sleep, a very uncomfortable proceeding in a sleeping bag. I therefore stipulated for a substantial barrier. We felled a tree above us, intending to roll the trunk down and place it on the outer edge of the shelf. But of course, with the usual cussedness of things, it slid down nearly to the river. Having got it back to a level with the ledge, we proceeded to put it in position, and it just got it fairly straight, when one end took charge and fell over the side. A fork at the other end hooked Douglas's leg, nearly carrying him over too, but luckily he grasped a root in the ground and hung there, with the whole weight on his leg. To fasten a rope round and secure the log to relieve him of the strain was the work of a minute, and then we had to struggle with the other end to heave it back into position. In due time, and after much unparliamentary language, we had both ends secured with a rope, and the canvas pitched. All this had to be done in a deluge of rain which, combined with our long fast, did not improve our tempers. On the way up in the morning, we had luckily shot a caca, which we had prepared and put into the billy to stew as soon as we arrived, having kindled a fire before building our shelter. At 4 p.m., taking off our wet things, we hung them in front of the fire, and having put our blankets round us until our clothes were dry, we sat down at last to discuss the stew, which by this time was ready. It may be imagined that the billy looked very foolish when we had finished. Hard work and a twenty-four hours fast tend to give a man a good appetite. This camp was no place to stay in if we could find a better, because it was on a very steep hillside, and there were many loose boulders lying about, which showed that falling stones or slips had to be feared in wet weather. It is never quite safe to camp on a steep sidling in heavy rain, for in Westland large landslips are common in the ranges during or after a storm. Consequently, we left early next morning, and in three hours had succeeded in advancing about three-quarters of a mile further up the river. Here we found a large boulder forming, with two others, a fair cave, which we soon turned into an excellent shelter, and spent several days in perfect comfort. This three hours was, I think, about the hardest bit of travelling we had, and as we toiled along, now crawling, now climbing, under and over the great boulders, I could not help comparing our progress to that of two ants crossing a newly metalled road. The difficulties in our path proved too much on several occasions for poor Betsy, who had to be hoisted about in the most rough and ready manner. Fortunately, our loads got lighter by a pound or so every day, so we knew that, on having to face this part of the river again, our burdens would be considerably lighter. Considering the contents of the swags we carried, and the usage they received up this river, it is wonderful that so little damage was done. There were fifteen pounds weight of instruments, photographic material, and field books in each load, before any things in the shape of camp or stores were added, 
and as these have to be rolled in a blanket and a piece of canvas, with a lot of mixed articles, it would not be surprising if damage ensued from the hauling and dumping they received over the large stones which were too slippery to negotiate under a handicap of sixty pounds. But I do not remember having an instrument, camera, or plates damaged once during the season in spite of rough usage, damp, fire, or floods, with the exception, by the way, of half a dozen glass plates broken before exposure and four half plates after. The latter, however, were probably damaged in the pack horse mail up the coast. The cave camp, though airy, was very comfortable. It had, like our usual shelters, a roof and two walls, but there was only room to sit and lie down. It was a foot too low to allow one to stand up. The weather was now becoming very wintry and cold. Snow fell two or three times, but did not lie permanently within three hundred feet of the cave. Our food, too, was getting monotonous. Flour and rice were all we had, and a very limited amount of each of those, because, having got no birds, on which we always relied, the stores brought up had to bear a double strain, or we had to be satisfied with very small rations. We used often to wish that we could see the picture which would present itself to a man coming up the river. If anyone had by chance followed us, he would have seen a low-roofed cavity under a huge boulder, in which sat two ragged men on a log in front of a large fire, and a hungry-looking dog lying close by. The men would be of doubtful nationality, having long, unkempt hair and beards, and with skins as brown as a penny. In all probability their clothes would be hanging at the side of the fire drying, and they would be sitting with their blankets wrapped round them, smoking their pipes and possibly playing a game of cribbage, with a pocket-book marked out as a board, or perhaps both would be reading, one lying down on the dry scrub, which served as bedding, and the other sitting up. Periodically the dog would get up and, stretching herself, would put on a piteous blind man's dog look in hopes of coaxing a little something to eat, but without success. A picture of this kind appears dismal, and I suppose the reality was about as depressing as one could imagine. The hours would drag slowly along because we could only afford two small doughboys or suet dumplings for each meal and only two meals a day. The weather was too bad to allow us to work, and it seemed little use looking at the aneroid barometer, which, however, we did constantly, in hopes that it would rise, but even the barometer seemed to have very little effect on the weather. Wet days with plenty of food are not unpleasant, as we could spend considerable time in cooking an elaborate, question mark, meal, but when hungry and with nothing to cook, it is painfully dreary. After consulting our watches periodically during the day, one of us would exclaim, by Jove, it's six o'clock at last. Let's sling the billy. Right you are. What are we going to eat? I vote for grilled chops, some bread and cheese, and a long beer. Oh, I'm tired of chops. Let's have some steak and kidney pie, and a Welsh rarebit to follow. The steak is too tough. What do you say to deviled kidneys? They give me indigestion. Well, then, goose and applesauce. I'm sick of geese. You're so confoundedly particular. Shall we have some doughboys? Good idea. Let us have a doughboy for a change. Now, we had been eating doughboys for breakfast and doughboys for tea for some days, and even then, only one doughboy the size of a man's fist. But such is the depressing effect of wet weather and short rations that we were really amused at our little joke, and probably repeated it again next morning. I recollect one evening when very hungry, telling Douglas of the winter dinner of the Alpine Club in London, at which I was in 1892 and we both felt quite cheerful after thinking of so many good things. In the evening we generally had a game or two of cribbage, discussed various items of news, three or four days old, which we had just gleaned from the papers, and at soon after eight o'clock boiled the billy again and made a small drink of cocoa. At nine p.m., having made up a large fire, we rolled into our respective blankets and dreamed of city banquets and good living until daylight. End of chapter nine. Chapter 10 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 10 Cook River Concluded and Ancient Glaciers. As soon as possible, we went on, partly by track cutting and partly in the riverbed, amongst the worst boulders we had yet seen. 
It was not a case of climbing over those stones, because that was impossible. We simply had to crawl and squeeze in and out amongst them, until we could find a place to leave the river and get onto the hillside, where we blazed a track. This was rendered necessary, because the boulders were practically impassable for half a mile. In three and a half hours, when we had gone perhaps a mile, certainly not much more, we came to the largest boulder in the river. This is named Tony's Rock, and must have come down on an ancient glacier from a mile and a half to two miles up the valley. It is not the same formation as that of Ryan's Peak, under which it lies. Behind it, on the slope, and leaning against it are several other giant stones, but not nearly so large. Above it, the riverbed is easier and more open, only a few large boulders appearing. The dimensions of Tony's Rock are height, 156 feet, aneroid, circumference, 843 feet. We were unable to measure more than the three sides of the stone, as the fourth had other stones heaped against it. However, we agreed at the time that the figure quoted was not over the mark, as the three sides alone exceeded 700 feet. I do not know the dimensions of known erratic blocks in other parts of the world, so cannot say how this compares with them. Douglas states that he measured one in the Waipara, a branch of the Arawata River, behind Jackson's Bay, and it showed slightly over 200 feet in height, with a girdle a trifle under 1,000 feet. In that locality there are several nearly as large, and one, which he could not measure, perhaps a little larger. Of these, however, I cannot speak from personal observation. The boulders in Cook River between Castle Rock and Tony's Rock are only approached by some in the Copeland River below Welcome Flat for number and size. As the lower side of Tony's apparently gave capital shelter, we decided to move our quarters at once, but before reaching Cave Camp again more rain set in, so we stayed there for the night. Next morning was cold and wet, snow falling at the cave, but at noon we packed our loads and during a lull in the storm made for Tony's Rock. Before reaching it, however, another snowstorm came on, and making the bush cold and wet drenched us and our loads very quickly. A short distance below Tony's Rock, the whole river goes over a fine fall of some fifty feet in height, caused by two large boulders obstructing its course. In the middle of the narrow channel, a knob of rock, not unlike a camel's head, makes the water rise in a wave six or eight feet high, and spread out in a fan-shaped mass of foam. Behind this fall, I believe one could walk and cross the riverbed dry shod, for it shoots out a considerable distance. The effect is very striking, as the river is by no means a small one, and in summer it would be even finer, for there would be a larger volume of water. The difficulty of obtaining a photograph of this fall afforded a good example of the size of the boulders. Hearing the roar of the water when cutting the track, we climbed a tree to look ahead, and saw the fall some two hundred yards or more further up the river. We therefore went to the edge of the bush, and found that, in order to get a good view, the camera should be out in the open. It was by no means easy to get down again into the river from the bank, which was formed of a series of large stones, against which the debris from the hillside has been heaped up. Determined, however, to get my photograph, I slid down the smooth surface of one of the rocks, and landed safely onto the top of another, some twenty-five feet below and was even then thirty feet above the water, on a flat boulder, off which I could not get, for it was standing in the river separated from the others, except on the side I had come down. Having taken the photograph, it was impossible to climb back, without help, up the smooth face down which I had come, and as we had left the rope at the cave, Douglas had to go back into the scrub to look for a pole, which was not easy to find owing to the vegetation, being gnarled and twisted at this altitude. However, he found one, which was just long enough for me to catch hold of, and having passed up my boots and camera, I was able with bare feet and help from Douglas to scramble to the top again. There is nothing exciting about this incident, but it helps, to some extent, to show how large the stones were. Just before reaching Tony's Rock, Betsy caught us the second bird we had found since leaving Castle Rock a week before. It was a decided curiosity in the shape of a white kiwi and no doubt its skin would be valuable, but as usual, hunger for meat overcame scientific ardor, so we made it into stew. The skin is the most nutritious part of a kiwi, therefore we could not afford to keep it for stuffing. Heavy snow fell again in the night, covering the ground around our shelter, which was some three thousand feet above sea level, and to our disgust we found that this palatial residence was a fraud, 
for the water trickled down on the inside and wetted us wherever we tried to sleep. I have always noticed that whenever there is a leak in canvas or rock, it always happens to occur exactly above one's face. The night was bitterly cold, as we had left our canvas at a lower camp, and the shelter under Tony's rock was so large that it was practically the same as sleeping in the open. We had not even our roof and two walls. The morning broke clear and frosty, but snow was lying a foot or more deep all around, and instead of melting, would in all probability lie in for the rest of the winter, gradually increasing in depth until the valley would be entirely blocked. It is hard to credit the amount of snow which collects in these narrow valleys in winter. Some must have two hundred or three hundred feet piled up in them during a bad winter by the heavy storms and frequent avalanches. More snow falls in the winter in New Zealand Alps than most persons would imagine, considering the temperate latitude, and in the spring it melts with great rapidity, causing heavy floods in the rivers. As our stock of provisions was now nearly finished, we decided to push up the river for one day, lay off the head of the valley hastily, and retreat before more bad weather delayed us indefinitely. Following the valley for some little distance, we turned up a creek off Ryan's Range on the right, and after a great deal of wading and pounding through soft snow and snow-covered scrub, reached a point from which we could complete the map of the valley. The snout of the La Perouse Glacier lay below us, a mile to two miles further up the valley, and the river flowed over a bed of smaller stones, which were easy to travel on until Tony's Rock was reached, after which it begins a rapid descent through the boulder-filled valley up which we came. Such a large basin at the head is unexpected and like the Balfour Valley, is a great deal wider than we had anticipated. This is owing to the very precipitous nature of the Balfour and Copeland Ranges, between which the river flows. Above Tony's Rock, the valley turns with a wide sweep to the left, and opens out on the south bank, while on the northern side the Balfour Range continues steeper than before. From the glacier to the bend in the river, the south bank slopes back more or less gently for perhaps half a mile showing three or four old moraine terraces, covered with low, dense mountain scrub. Behind these slopes, Mount Copeland and Little's Peak, rise abruptly in immense precipices of two or three thousand feet. Mount Stokes, La Perouse, and Hicks apparently block the head of the valley, while Mount Cook shows over Harper's Saddle. The La Perouse Glacier, however, comes off the main range between Mount Tasman and Dampier, the upper portion lying away to the left, round another bend only the snout and lower portion of the glacier being visible until a higher point on Ryan's range is reached. As seen in May 1894, the picture describes description. The valley was blocked with snow to the water's edge, the river looking like a black ribbon in the white snow, as it flowed down the valley in graceful curves. The giant cliffs of Copeland and Little's Peak were white from base to summit, the snow having been blown against the steep faces and frozen by the cold wind and frost of the night formed glistening icicles. At first, there was little black rock to relieve the dazzling whiteness of the landscape, but after the sun had been up some hours, the precipices began to shed their white mantle, and the steep buttresses and couloirs began to show their shapes and forms. Now and then the stillness, which was almost oppressive, was broken by a slight hissing noise, which gradually increased into a roar, as a great avalanche poured down over cliffs of Little's or Ryan's Peak. One descended within three hundred yards of us, bounding over a sheer drop of seven hundred feet or more, like a great waterfall, about fifty yards broad, and lasting for two or three minutes. Our clothes had become very tattered and worn, owing to the rough usage coming up the river, and afforded us very little warmth. Consequently, the morning's work, wading through snow and bruising under and over snow-covered scrub, had chilled us to the bone. Yet when we had finished our observations, we were loth to leave such a glorious view, in spite of the cold and hunger. I have often wondered what we should have thought of that scene, if we had been warmly clad and well fed, because my experience is that discomfort spoils the enjoyments of a view to some extent. And if we admired the head of Cook River, as we saw it in our somewhat wretched condition, how much more beautiful would it have appeared under pleasanter circumstances? Down the valley to the north, we could see a bank of angry-looking clouds rolling in from the sea, and already settling down over Craig's range, so we dared not stay any longer, in case another storm prevented our getting down the river. Therefore, hurrying back to Tony's Rock, we packed our loads without delay, and made for the cave, which we reached about sunset. Here a good fire and an extra doughboy each, 
including Betsy, soon made us forget the discomfort of a day's work in soft snow and ragged garments. On the way down we saw a cuckoo, and his usual companion the check-shirt bird. It is not customary to find these birds in the mountains during the early winter, as they generally migrate to warmer latitudes at the end of the summer and return in the spring. The former is the Maori Koikwa, Eudinimus tetensis, and like his English namesake, he makes use of other birds' nests. The check shirt follows him in his migrations, and is often seen with him in the lower hills. I heard a curious story connected with this little wanderer, told by a friend of mine in a digger's hut. He said that sailors believe these birds to represent the spirits of drowned men, and that it is therefore unlucky to kill them. On one occasion he was down south, below Gillespie's, and with five others, was trying to shoot a check-shirt bird close to the hut of another digger, whom I shall call Mac. Old Mac came out to where they were shooting, and begged them to desist, for it was bad luck, he said, and meant a violent end to those concerned in the death of the bird. Of course, his hearers laughed at the idea, but he was very earnest, and said he would give them evidence of the truth of his statement. Taking them into his hut, he related his own life's history. He was one of a party of Newfoundland fishermen, who left their homes in a ship built by themselves for Australia in the early days of the gold diggings. When a few days away from land, they discovered that, though all were sailors, they knew nothing about navigation. Consequently, the ship drifted about aimlessly for weeks. In the course of time, they fell in with a man of war, and discovered that instead of being near the Cape of Good Hope, they were off the horn. The commander of the warship put a man on board, with a knowledge of navigation, and he piloted the unfortunate ship to Adelaide, from whence they all went to the gold fields. Mac had no luck, so he shipped on board a trading schooner to the islands, and all went well till some man was fool enough to kill a check-shirt bird. From that day their luck changed, and ultimately they lost the schooner in a gale. Five or six men succeeded in getting away in an open boat, and were afloat for many days. The boat was picked up by a steamer near Auckland, and in it were four dead bodies, and a living skeleton, almost a maniac from his fearful sufferings. This was old Mac. It was a long time before he recovered, and was able to go down to Westland to try his luck again on a gold field. My informant assured me that the manner in which the old fellow related his tale, and the power with which he described his awful time in the boat, with the dead bodies, too weak to throw them overboard, exceeded anything he had ever read. Mac ended his yarn by saying, Anyway, you can't kill them with shot. You must use silver. Out of consideration for the old sailor's feelings, my friend took no further part in the proceedings, but he remembers as he went away, seeing a man cutting up a half-crown. Whether they killed the bird or not, he never heard. All he can say is that three out of the five died violent deaths, and as the others have gone away, he cannot say what became of them. As he said, it is one of those curious coincidences which tend to strengthen people's belief in superstitions. One long day from the cave camp took us to the digger's huts, where one of our friends insisted on our staying, and we enjoyed a good meal for the first time for ten days. But as he was short of meat, we pushed on next morning to Ryan's hut, to find it empty and nothing to eat, only one or two rotten potatoes. These were naturally hardly good enough. Therefore, on the following day, we started breakfastless to Mr. Wilson's survey camp at Cook River Settlement, seven miles away over the flats. Here Bill Boyd, the cook, with the help of mutton, vegetables, and plum duff, soon persuaded us that life was, after all, worth living. It may perhaps be thought that we only had ourselves to blame for short rations and starvation on this trip, but I think it was our misfortune, not our fault. In the first place, the valley was unexplored, and we had every right to look forward to as many birds as we had need of for food. And as we always relied greatly on these, we only took enough food to last us for the trip, with help of birds. Again, we did not anticipate more than ten days' work at the most, so we took flour, rice, oatmeal, tea, cocoa, sugar, a little meat, treacle, suet, for cooking dough boys, and a tin or two of sardines in sufficient quantity, plus birds, to last us for that period. Had we found birds, as we reasonably anticipated, the provisions we took would with care have lasted more than two weeks, and even if they were exhausted, we could have lived well with the help of the pea rifle. The luck was against us in every respect. For the first three or four days we had meat, 
and went on eating as if there was no need to economize. By that time we had gone some way up the river, and the bad weather not only prevented a retreat, but delayed our advance. Consequently, having only caught the kiwi and kaka, we had to live for ten days relying entirely on the stores which were left, and which, owing to delays, would only keep us reasonably if we had found plenty of game. To give some idea of the help that we derive from birds, I may safely say that stores, which would usually last for ten days comfortably, would only give perhaps three days of good meals in the event of finding no birds. It is no joke to be compelled to divide six good meals, consisting of flour and rice, into rations to extend over ten days, and at the same time do a considerable amount of heavy work. The less said about our clothes, the better. After a long season of eight months in the ranges, the constant wet, rough usage in bush and scrub, etc., soon made havoc of the best materials. The only original garment of mine now in existence is a coat of Burberry's gabardine, which lasted me without tearing for the whole of this season and the next, and is now gracing the back of a digger down south, and he still swears by it. Some valleys are so narrow that, if they run east and west, there are places in them which never get the sun, winter or summer. Here the bush, which grows just as luxuriantly, is always wet, and if we are above bush line, snow or creeks wet us daily. Ordinary tweeds therefore become rotten, and are easily torn. I find the best costume to be a flannel shirt, woolen jersey, and thick knitted woolen drawers, without trousers, and some spare canvas to patch with. It is absolutely necessary to wear flannel or wool next to the skin, owing to the constant wet, and woolen garments underneath trousers are too hot for my comfort, so I generally dispense with the latter. After a few months, one may be said to be wearing a number of patches, connected together by woolen material. After leaving Cook River, I decided to go north to Hokitika, as winter would prevent further work, and there were two hundred or more photographs to develop and print, also sundry work to be done in the office to complete the field work. Accordingly, having spent a few days in photographing the wondrous panoramas and other views from the flats and sea bluffs, I tramped with my goods and chattels some thirty miles along the beach to Okarito. Here I obtained a horse from the mailman, and in three days arrived at Hokitika, after a spell of nearly eight months in a batwing, six of which were spent in the ranges, chiefly on new ground. Our work up Cook River finally settled a doubtful point in the topography of the district, namely the course of the Balfour Range. When in 1890 Blackiston and I made the first ascent of Harper's Saddle at the head of the Hooker Glacier, we were unable, owing to the fog, to see clearly down to the west coast. On our return I was asked by the Westland Survey Department, firstly, what was the true course of the Divide? Secondly, was the Balfour Range an offshoot of Hicks, St. David's Dome, or Tasman? The first question I answered without hesitation, but the second had to be left for future solution. On looking at the map made from distant trigonometrical stations, I was inclined to believe that there was an error in the Balfour Glacier and Range, because, if the latter was an offshoot of the divide near Tasman, it left such a ridiculously small neve for the glacier, which was shown to be four or five miles long. The La Perouse Glacier had been put in by guesswork, and it was more than probable that it was shown far too large, and that its upper basin really belonged to the Balfour Glacier. This would mean that the Balfour Range was an offshoot of Mount Hicks, and not of Tasman, or possibly might be a detached range. In the event of the latter being the case, the large neve alluded to would supply both glaciers. However, up Cook River and from Ryan's Peak later on, the truth was evident, and it is now finally settled that the Balfour Range comes off the divide, just south of Mount Tasman. Also, the La Perouse is a large glacier, as shown on the map, and nearly clear of surface moraine. The glacier is nearly five miles long and descends by a fine icefall from its neve, flowing in graceful curves between high precipices, with one or two tributaries from the east. It has but little surface moraine as compared with other New Zealand glaciers, having only a fringe of debris on each side, and being completely covered near its terminal face. About a quarter of its length from the snout, a peculiar bar of moraine running across it from side to side, looks as if a large slip had come down and shot right across the ice. The course of the Balfour Range having been settled, it only remains to find some reason for so large a glacier as the Balfour, which is six miles long, 
flowing from such an insignificant neve. I have already described this glacier with its neve detached from its trunk. The only available theory, so far as I can see, is that the great western face of Tasman, which rises abruptly in precipices for over 7,000 feet from the glacier, is too steep to hold much snow. It faces southwest, the cold quarter, and must catch an immense quantity of snow in the winter, which comes down frequently in large avalanches, filling the upper end of the valley and forming the trunk of the glacier. There are also no doubt avalanches from Craig's Range on the northern side of the glacier, and these bring down masses of debris and broken rock, which completely cover the ice and to a large extent protect it from the sun's heat. The steep ranges surrounding the valley must also prevent the sun from reaching the glacier in the winter, and also part of the day in the summer. When Douglas explored the left-hand branch of the Copeland River, a tributary of the Karangarua, in 1892, he noticed that, though Mount Stokes apparently dropped without interruption to the Strachan Glacier, the avalanches from the peak never reached the bottom, but appeared to be swallowed up halfway down the slope. This led him to expect one of those peculiar instances of the broken nature of the ranges in the form of a large fissure in the mountainside, or a narrow deep gorge with an outlet into Cook River. We were therefore looking out for such a cleft, when at the head of the river, and found that his suspicions were correct, for a narrow and dark gorge comes into the valley, evidently containing a small glacier formed by avalanches. There was too much snow to see whether a glacier really existed, but we decided that there was a small one. The stream from it flows into Cook River, a short distance below the La Perouse Glacier. The Cook River glaciers were evidently, in the past, of considerable size, to judge by the numerous moraines and terraces in the upper and lower parts of the valleys. The stream of ice which came down the main valley was probably the largest, and its marks are to be seen on the lower end of the Balfour Range, a considerable height above the river. On the slopes under Ryan's Peak, the erratic blocks scattered on the hillside show that the ice must have been 700 feet thick, at the least below Tony's Rock. After forcing its way down the valley of the Cook River, it would be joined by a stream of ice which came down the Balfour Valley from Mount Tasman of the day. Between McBain's Creek and the Balfour River is a rounded hill which has evidently been shaped by glacier action, and must at one period have been completely covered with ice. Behind this hill to the east is a low, flat depression, showing that the ice, after shrinking somewhat, had still found its way into the main glacier, down McBain's Creek, as well as the Balfour Gorge, and on shrinking still further it had ceased to flow down the creek, and only found one outlet through the gorge of the present river. After being augmented by this ice stream, and a smaller one from Craig's Range, the glacier would flow down to the flat country, probably joining the ice from the Fox Valley and from the south. There is little doubt, from Douglas's observations in the many rivers he has explored, that the general direction of the ancient ice flow was north. My own observations, small though they are in comparison with his, tend to support his theory. In the south there is, perhaps, as fine an ancient moraine as anywhere in Westland, namely, the Cascade Moraine, which begins at 200 feet and goes back gradually rising to 1900 feet in height. Formerly, it projected four miles out to sea to Open Bay Island, which has some moraine debris on it. In this moraine, Douglas, who explored that country some years ago, found several red stones which had come north from the Red Hill country. In no case has he discovered any red rocks lying south of that country, but always north. An interesting feature about the Cascade Moraine, from a geologist's point of view, is that it is stratified, and in some of the layers seashells are to be found well inland. Other evidences of the northern flow of the ice is to be found in the old Wanganui and Hokitika glaciers. In the two rivers of these names there are belts of serpentine rock, pieces and blocks of which Douglas has found north of these rivers, but never south. In the Waitaha River, for instance, he found several proofs that an ancient glacier came over from the Wanganui country to that valley, carrying with it blocks of serpentine rock. The moranic drift of the ancient Franz Joseph and Callery glaciers is to the north, round Lake Maparika, and could be traced even further than that, and the greatest mass of drift near Cook River lies to the north, and if this theory of the ice flow is correct, it would belong to the old glacier. The whole of the low country is covered with moranic hills, and terraces of various heights, up to 300 or 400 feet, 
At intervals, along the sea beaches, these terraces form the bluffs, already mentioned. It has been assumed from past observations made in the low country only, that the old glaciers flow direct to the sea, between these high terraces. This, however, I venture to think, is the wrong view to take. My belief is that the ancient glaciers, being some six hundred feet thick at the point they left the valleys, would spread out over an immense area when the lateral pressure of the hillsides was removed. Probably at one time they joined and formed a vast sea of ice at the foot of the hills, covered with a heavy mass of moraine caused by constant denudation in the mountains. When the period of retreat began, they separated again and gradually retired up the valleys, leaving a confusion of moraine hillocks all over the lower country. This vast accumulation of morainic drift would be gradually cut through by the rivers, thus forming the high terraces now seen along the river sides, and which have hitherto been taken for lateral moraines. If the theory here advanced be correct, then the terraces would not necessarily be either terminal or lateral moraines, but merely accidental embankments, carved into their present shape by the rivers. Should, however, the theory that they are lateral moraines be the right one, then I am at a loss to understand what caused the vast collection of moranic deposits between the rivers and in places along the foot of the hills where no valleys exist. It seems that those accumulation of drift hills lying north of the Waiho River and also north of Cook River must have been left by the great ice flow extending all over the low country, and had it not been for the rivers of a later date cutting broad valleys to the sea, they would have extended over the whole coast in hopeless confusion, and no long terraces would have existed at all. From the Taramakau River to Bruce Bay, twenty miles south of Gillespie's, the rivers have cut through old morainic accumulations, which extend from the hills in many cases to the present sea beach, and from Bruce Bay to Jackson's Bay the sea bluffs are rocky, and the old moraines do not appear again till after the latter place is passed. There has been in the past a considerable amount of gold brought out of Cook River, but at the present time two or three diggers only make a small living, just above the point where the river leaves the hills. Traces or colors of gold have been found a considerable distance up the main branch, but not payable. And in the Balfour gold was obtained in the sixties, which paid well, I believe, at the junction of the two rivers, and was traced right up to the glacier. Harry the Whale and Dick Nicholl, two old fossickers, are said to have discovered the Balfour Glacier in 1866, but it is quite useless to consider the journeys made by diggers, for they never bring out any information that is reliable. How far up Cook River they went, it is hard to say, though a tradition exists of Harry the Whale, German Harry, and Tony the Greek, having gone up some miles and crossed the Copeland Range into Architect Creek, which flows into the Copeland River. The enterprising old school of diggers and prospectors is fast dying out, but Paddy McKenna, an old man, now and then makes solitary trips up the Balfour, where he is commonly supposed to have located a gold-bearing reef. It is sad to see these old-time prospectors disappearing, and no one to take their places. The younger generation on the West Coast have a strong dislike, I may say fear, not only of the hard work and life entailed by journeys into the ranges, but also have a rooted objection to going off the beaten track. They are good enough men on horses after cattle near their huts, but neither love nor money will tempt them to go far afield. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 11 The Franz Joseph Glacier. Second Visit Winter Snow. Successful Ascent to Neve. Ice Formation. Moraine Formation. Old Moraines and Glaciers. Advance and Retreat. June, July, and August, being our winter months, it was useless to attempt any hill work. Therefore, after six weeks' office work in Hokitika, I returned to Christchurch for a few weeks' holiday. Unlimited golf and sundry expeditions of my lantern slides before the New Zealand Alpine Club and other institutions made the time pass quickly, and before I had well shaken down to civilized life, it was time to return. 
From our work on the Franz Josef Glacier during the previous summer, it was evident that early spring was the best season for attacking the icefall and upper ice. I therefore obtained permission to try and reach the Neve in September, and at the same time to make observations as to winter retreat or advance, and generally supplement the former report. On September 13, 1894, I arrived at the Forks, and after some difficulty obtained a man to accompany me to the glacier. The mere mention of going on to the glacier frightened most of the young fellows in the district. However, one of them joined me, in spite of warnings from his mates, prepared to face all sorts of unknown evils. Friday, September 14th. We pitched the bat wing in the same place as last year at Camp 1, and had everything ready by 3 p.m. While looking about in the scrub round camp in the evening for a straight pole to use in camp, I found a small case for carrying soap, which I had lost last year. A weka must have taken it away from camp before we left in February. Saturday, September 15th. Grand weather, very cold, even here in the mornings. Made a traverse of the terminal face, which showed general retreat, a new rock appearing by number one Harper's Rock. In the afternoon we fossicked a route over to the north side landing, a little further up than last year, near the first small ice fall, ice very broken and troublesome. Went along the side to Rope Creek, and found the ice so far retreated that we could not get down without a rope. Left a small load here, which we brought along to lighten the weight tomorrow. Hailstorm in the evening. Sunday, September 16th. Moved to Camp 2 in the afternoon with fly only. Raining all the morning and showers during the afternoon. Cold quarters up here, with only one blanket at this time of the year. Rigged up fly in the usual way, with two end windbreaks. Our little female weka of last year still here, and seems very glad to see us. Very tame. Monday, 17th. Tried all the morning to find a route onto the glacier. My mate did not appreciate the pleasures of being let down into a crevasse to cut steps, nor of going along steep sides of the hummocks in small footholds. After three attempts we found a route two hundred yards further up than last season. Not by any means a good one, but safe enough at this time of the year. Went up to Camp 3 to see if we could camp there. Also marked our line with rotted twigs through the extraordinarily crevassed and broken ice below Cape Defiance. Found deep snow on the bank at Camp 3. Should only save an hour and a half by camping there, and should have to break a day if we moved up tomorrow, so returned to Camp 2. Found that the rata twigs saved about one half of the time taken in going up. The ice here is simply a maze of long ridges, very narrow, between deep crevasses, and in such an uneven fashion that I could not see a route for certain more than one hundred yards ahead. Consequently, we were often forced to retreat our steps, having been blocked. Fixed three measurement cairns between camp and point E, the rocky cape on eastern bank, in the afternoon. Bathed, baked bread, made a stew, changed my plates, and lost my temper in the evening. N.B. I presume the fire smoked when I was baking, but cannot remember. Tuesday, September 18th. Glorious moonlight last night. Up at 2.45 a.m., but did not leave camp till 4 a.m. My mate did not see much catch in getting up so early in the winter and wanted to know, what's the odds of an hour or two? Glacier and ranges looked simply magnificent by moonlight. Could see everything quite clearly. Even on the low country we were able to distinguish some features, and beyond it the sea. Travelled quickly to just below Cape Defiance when the moon dipped down behind Mount Moltke, leaving us in deep shadow right in the middle of the rough ice. Blundered along slowly, the deep crevasses looking very ghostly as we crawled along the narrow ridges in the dark. Now and then would see a rotted twig faintly. As dawn came up we got out of the crevassed ice and were opposite the Unzerfritz waterfall. Had it not been for the rotted twigs we should have been quite an hour longer in the rough going. Unser Fritz was silent, frozen from top to bottom in one icicle, 1,209 feet in length. The absolute silence of so large a fall was very imposing. We put on the rope halfway up the ice fall, and were opposite Almer Glacier at 8 a.m. and had breakfast. Snow covered everything, but all the seracs were standing just the same, the snow bridges being some 10 or 15 feet below the general level of the glacier. For a few chains above the inflow of the Almer, I thought every moment that we should be stopped, 
the hummocks and seracs formed a perfect labyrinth, and the crevasses between them were not ridged very strongly. I have never in all my experience seen such a hopeless confusion of broken, crevassed, and generally rough ice. The snow became painfully soft after 10 a.m., but we pounded along, taking turns in the lead, and as we were now high up in the neve, there was little or no chance of going through into crevasses. The snow was so deep. At noon we were well up into the southeastern corner of the head basin, and there I was able to do all that had to be done for the map. The plan which we made the previous summer is practically correct, and only one or two minor corrections to be made. We went on a little further, to within about a mile and a half, perhaps less, of Graham's saddle to the Tasman. I wanted to go on, and at least ascend Graham's saddle, but my companion was a firm believer in the eight hours' day, and would not consent to more, so I had to suit myself to him, more or less. I told him that now he had done all that was necessary, and anything else we did would be voluntary work for our own amusement, and asked him if he was willing to go over to the Tasman. He was decided in his objections, as he had had enough of this bloomin' work, and didn't give a D for the scenery. He was paid for a day's work only, and had done that. I therefore gave up the idea, wondering at such a lack of enthusiasm. We started back at 1 p.m., traveled as fast as the very soft snow would allow to the top of the icefall, and having our tracks to follow, took very little time in passing the Serac ice. I feared that the snow bridges would be weaker, so lengthened the rope to 30 feet, and always kept a hummock of ice between us. This was necessary for the leader on two occasions crossed a crevasse safely and mounted a hummock, but on going down into the next hollow to be ready in case the second man broke the bridge, he would go bodily through the snow, and the bridge, which he had safely crossed, would let the second man through. Thus we were both in crevasses with the rope taut over the intervening hummock. To scramble out was no trouble, and beyond confirming my mate in his opinion that he had got into most dangerous company, no harm was done. We reached camp about 5 p.m., very burnt with the new snow, the day having been cloudless throughout. I very much doubt if the snow would last for another two weeks of sufficient strength to allow a route to be found in rough seracs at the top of the ice fall. The neve of the glacier is, roughly, a circular basin of three miles in diameter, and is surrounded by some fine peaks between 9,000 and 10,000 feet. Out of the southern side the peaks of the dividing range rise in pinnacles, and knobs of rock out of the sea of ice, affording interesting rock climbs. The first ascents of the peaks from De La Beche, 9,835 feet, to Conway, 9,611 feet, will probably be done from this glacier, as their slopes toward the Tasman are clothed with hanging glaciers, which send down avalanches night and day during the summer. On the southeastern side, the range dividing the Franz Joseph from the watershed of the Callery branches from the Minaret, 10,022 feet, and has three nice peaks in St. Mildred's, Drummond's, and Stirling Rock. The two latter are very easy climbs of snow, the former a rock climb entirely. The peaks of the Bismarck Range are, on the whole, disappointing from this side, as they are merely small peaks of rock, standing 500 to 1,000 feet out of a snow field, which slopes up to them in a series of broken ice falls. In the summer the neve is almost all broken and crevassed. The lower portion as it approaches the ice fall is, I feel sure, impassable after Christmas. It is quite bad enough in the early spring. To make a sense of the peaks surrounding the neve, a party must cross from the Tasman via Graham's saddle or from the Fox Glacier. They can try to reach the neve from the terminal face if they wish to, and I hope they will enjoy the experience. Wednesday, September 19th. Note. See Appendix Note 7. End of note. I fixed some measurement cairns along the side, below Camp 2, and we returned to Camp 1 in the afternoon. Thursday, September 20th. My horse had gone away down the river, so I tracked and caught him, below Nisbet's hut. Returned to the camp in the afternoon and packed the whole of it to the hospital, where I found Arthur Woodham alone. Stayed at the hut. Friday, September 21st. I rode down to Forks and found instructions from Hokitika to go at once to Gillespie's and with Douglas, explore the Karangarua River. This visit, together with our work in the previous summer, was productive of some interesting facts concerning the movement and general conditions of the Franz Joseph Glacier. In the first place, 
The ice of the lower portion of the glacier appeared to be very soft and rotten, in comparison to that of other glaciers, a natural consequence of its low altitude. The ice crystals were very large and easily detached and separated from one another. It was very difficult in some places to form a step, as a blow of the axe would scatter the loose crystals in every direction, and sometimes, when a step had been cut, which to all appearance was as strong as necessary, the floor would give way by crumbling under one's weight. In the winter, however, during the last visit, I found it much easier to get about, because the ice was firmer, and there was far less likelihood of rapid changes. The constant alteration in the forms and shapes of the crevasses and seracs was in the summer most puzzling, and sometimes an absence of a week would be sufficient for the ice to alter to such an extent as to render a new route necessary. This activity is no doubt due as much to low altitude as to the speed with which the glacier descends over its rough bed. It is not noticeable all over the lower portions of the trunk. After an absence of a day or two, we have found new crevasses open, even on the dry ice, and as already stated, we constantly heard reports and felt a slight shock pass, like a tremble over the surface. While sitting in camp, too, we could hear the glacier cracking and groaning on a still night. In fact, one of the first things I noticed on my second visit was the absolute stillness of the nights compared with our summer experience. I have already given some idea of the very broken surface of the glacier, and need only add that I have never seen one with so little good travelling on it. Having had a considerable experience on glaciers, I can generally find a route through rough ice without much loss of time, and certainly never expected to be reduced to leaving a line of marks behind for use on the return journey, as we did here. It was not really necessary, but it saved a lot of time, and was very little trouble. The broken surface will account for the absence of large deposits of surface moraine, which might be expected here owing to the broken nature of the hillsides and spurs in the upper part of the valley. Below Point E and Cape Defiance, there is no broken rock at all, save the slip which has recently come down and is the cause of the single patch of surface debris now fast approaching the terminal face. The glacier seems to descend in two, and sometimes three, distinct layers. The upper one is pure white ice, and the lower one's generally dirty. The stones which fall into the crevasses are ground up like grain between two millstones, and wherever it finds an opening between two layers, the silt, resulting from the grinding, oozes out in the form of mud. I have found a hollow under such an outlet full of mud, to a depth of two feet or more. Owing to the nearness of the surrounding trees, there is a large amount of timber in the ice, and lying at the terminal face in the small moraines. Once or twice, while cutting steps near the junction of two layers, my axe struck a piece of wood and stuck fast in it. The timber on the glacier and at the terminal face has a smooth, worn look about it, as if it had been well sandpapered. It is chiefly rata, a very hard wood, and must have undergone a great deal of rubbing and grinding. In some places, the upper section of the ice could be seen standing away from the lower. Half a mile from the terminal face, I saw a space of three inches or more between the two layers, extending back into the ice for some distance, and everywhere on the glacier, if one happened to be cutting a step near the junction, a large piece of ice would break away, leaving a smooth, mud-covered surface at the top of the lower layer. The comparative motion of the ice in a glacier at different depths is little known, and could I think be measured at places on the Franz Joseph with little difficulty. I fully intended to do it on my second visit, but had no time. It is here perfectly evident that the surface ice moves far quicker than the lower portion, for the upper layer of white ice can be seen at the terminal face, pushing its way over the lower layer, and periodically breaking off in large pieces. This possibility is due to the rocky obstacles at the terminal face, and underneath the glacier, obstructing the flow of the lower portion, while it does not interfere with the upper. The layers are horizontal in some places, and in others incline slightly against the flow of the ice. One very noticeable result of the large quantity of moraine debris falling into the crevasses and being ground up between the separate layers of ice is that the old terminal moraines are composed of a layer of rolled stones, with angular blocks on the top of them in some places, and in others are almost entirely made up of the former. This is, of course, because other slips have occurred in the past, and covering the glacier have travelled down with the ice. A large proportion of the stones, having dropped into crevasses, come out at the terminal face in a rounded form, 
while the balance has come down on the surface of the glacier and been dropped over in an angular form onto the top of the other, thus forming the two sections in the terminal moraines. In some of the sea bluffs, the layers of rolled stones under angular blocks are easily to be seen where the sea has cut into them and exposed a section of their formation. I have heard many theories put forward to account for this stratified appearance, though it is common in all old moraines. Douglas, in his report on the Franz Joseph, note, New Zealand Lands and Survey Report, 1893-94, to 94, end of note, written after our visit, mentions the process which is evidently going on at present in the glacier, and assumes rightly that a similar process went on in ancient times on a larger scale, and would account for the formations in the bluffs, which are, of course, old moraines. He is inclined to put forward a theory based on that assumption that the old moraines now forming the sea bluffs are not lateral, but terminal moraines. From what he has told me of his own observations, and from like observations, in a much smaller degree of my own, I agree with him that they are not lateral moraines, but I cannot go as far as he does and say that they are therefore terminal. There is, I imagine, no reason why the evidence of stratification should be confined to terminal moraines. May it not also exist in lateral moraines, when the ice is pushing its way over level country, and not between hillsides? For it would be depositing rolled stones from its lower portion, and dropping them from its upper portion, in the form of angular blocks along its sides, as well as at its terminal face. If this is a sound conclusion, then the inland moraine hills, which contain the two forms of stones, may be either lateral or terminal moraines. If the reasoning is not sound, then all, or nearly all, the old moranic deposits must be terminal moraines, and that I do not think can be admitted. Some ideas concerning the ancient glaciers and their deposits were put forward in the last chapter, and if they are correct, there would be a field of ice extending over almost the whole of the low country, fed by the numerous glaciers from the ranges. Such an ice field, before it broke up, would not have either lateral or terminal moraines on the flat country, for the debris would drop into the sea on one side, or form a lateral terrace at the foot of the hills on the other. On the period of retreat beginning, it would gradually divide itself into separate streams, corresponding with the glaciers supplying it, and would leave behind it a confused mass of moranic accumulations, which could hardly be classed as terminal or lateral moraines, until it had almost retired into the hills. These would be stratified, having layers of glacier drift and angular blocks throughout. Other glaciers, like the Tasman, Balfour, etc., which are covered with great masses of angular rocks, are not sufficiently broken or crevassed to swallow up a great amount of moraine. Thus, the double process does not now go on to such a noticeable extent on these glaciers as on the Franz Joseph. It is only during the next few years that it can be seen on the latter, for when the present surface moraine caused by the slip has dropped over the terminal face, there will be no more to come down on the surface unless another landslip covers the ice with debris. The ancient Waiho Glacier may, or may not, have been of first-class importance. Douglas thinks that it was not, because he cannot find any of the higher old ice lines, which he has found in other parts. In the upper valleys of the Karangarua, as will be seen later, I noted several instances of these old ice lines, which appeared in the form of distinct terraces in the rocky hillsides, abraded by ancient glaciers. Douglas's remarks on the subject, I quote, quote in valleys containing large glaciers, I have always found four tiers of terraces, or old ice lines. These lines keep a wonderfully regular distance from each other, and their inclination is very uniform, from say 4,000 feet to 600 feet, or 700 feet, where the river valley breaks out of the hills. The longer the valley, the more gentle the slope. The best places to see these lines are up the Host, near the 18-mile bluff, and better still, the wonderful terraces of Mount Cariah up the Arawata River, where the old lines can be seen quite distinctly for 4,000 feet up and running for miles down the valley. In the smaller valleys, two or three terraces are visible, and in still smaller ones there are none. From this I would conclude that the Franz Joseph, although the largest glacier at present, was, during the great ice period, of second or maybe even third-rate importance. It must have been far eclipsed by Cook's and the Karangarua." End quote. Note. New Zealand Lands and Survey Report, 1893-94, page 73. End of note. 
It is true that in the Franz Joseph branch of the Waiho there are not four ice lines visible, like there are in the two last named rivers, but I do not think it necessarily proves that this was of second-rate importance. The Cooks, Karangarua, and Haast River, to my knowledge, and the Arawata River, from Douglas's accounts, flow through harder and more solid country, and therefore would show these old ice lines in a more distinct and lasting form. The Waiho is shattered country, and the lines have probably worn away by the action of the climate and weather generally. The enormous morainic accumulations around Lake Mapurika, and even north of that, point to a glacier of considerable importance. About three miles below the junction of the two branches, or five miles below the terminal face, there is an old terminal moraine almost semicircular, through which the river has cut a channel. This is perhaps a hundred feet high but we had no time to examine it. Comparatively speaking, this is a recent deposit, but to which of the ice lines at present visible it belongs, I would not pretend to say. At no very remote period, the Waiho River flowed north into Lake Maporica, and it is quite possible that this old moraine divided the river northwards until it was cut through by the water, which again resumed its old course to the sea. While speaking of moraines, it is worth calling attention to the very ridiculous attempts this glacier has made to form lateral moraines. Below point E, the rocky cape on the eastern bank, there is a line of boulders about 200 feet above the ice, which have been left balanced in the most insecure manner on the bare rock slope. Just below camp 2, another small lateral line of stones can be seen in a precarious position. The only real piece of lateral moraine to be found is above Cape Defiance in the bend by Harper's Creek. The ice has flowed down the valley and meets this obstruction, causing it to eddy into the bend and force its way up in great waves against the cape. The likeness of a glacier to a river is here most evident, for the ice has done exactly the same as a river would do in a similar case. Having flowed against the cape, which projects twenty chains across the line of flow, it has banked up behind it, and turned round the rocky point in high pinnacles corresponding to the waves in a river. And whereas a river would, in a similar case, deposit large masses of driftwood on a bank, the glacier has thrown up a high lateral moraine of stones, which have come down in the ice from above the ice fall. It has also caused the debris to come to the surface, and the ice in the bend is covered with stones. The absence of all other lateral moraines is due to the solid rock walls which line the glacier on both sides below Cape Defiance, and which are too steep to allow any stones to rest on them, with the two exceptions mentioned by Camp 2. Also, the broken nature of the glacier has caused all the debris to fall into crevasses, and therefore has left very few, if any, stones for it to deposit on the sides. When Douglas and I were in the valley during our first visit, we concluded from various signs at the terminal face and along the sides, that a winter advance of considerable importance took place annually, followed by a large summer retreat. We had ample evidence of the latter, and my visit in September was made in hopes of finding a decided winter advance. We based our conclusions on the fact that in November 1893, when we arrived at Camp 1, there was a beautiful cone of ice, 110 feet in height, between the Strontian and Müller rocks. This was covered apparently with riverbed shingle, and seemed to be due to a recent advance during the winter. It touched the latter rock along its base to a height of twenty-five feet. Other evidence was found in the fresh-dressed surfaces, just beyond the edge of the ice, which were of a lighter color than the rock above, and also there were signs of recent disturbances in small terminal moraines. During our stay in the neighborhood, the rapid shrinking, due to the low altitude of the ice, was most marked. The level of the top of the ice at the terminal face fell 70 feet between November 1st and March 1st, by breaking and melting, and the retreat during the same period was considerable. The most noticeable was at the ice cone. This was, at the beginning of November, quite perfect in shape, and in the position already stated. At the end of February, it had lost all shape, and collapsed into a small heap of dirty, broken ice, some thirty feet high, besides retreating, twenty-two yards in the front, and about ten yards from the rock against which it originally rested. A new rock, which we named the Outlet Rock, was uncovered during February near the outflow of the glacier, to the extent of ten yards. All along the eastern bank a general shrinkage was visible when we left, 
and as far as we could see on the western side as well. I was not, however, prepared to say that the ice was retreating on the whole, because we fully anticipated that it would recover its lost ground again in the winter, when the melting would not be so great. For behind the sentinel, an ice cone was thrown up considerably in advance of the rest of the glacier, to a height of forty feet in five weeks at the end of the summer. This lifted with it riverbed stones, but did not last long, for when we left it had begun to decrease in size again. We made two marks, by means of which a future visitor might test the retreat, and I was able to use them again in my second visit, when I also made several more cairns for future use. Instead of the large winter advance which we had anticipated, I found a general and considerable retreat all over the glacier, with the single exception of a slight advance between the barren and strontian rocks. The ice behind the Sentinel had, in February 1894, been 120 leagues distant from the rock, and in September of the same year had retired to a distance of 225 links, or a retreat of 1.05 chains. Between Harper and Park rocks, a new rock appeared, which, however, may be part of the former. It was buried in the ice and raked by pieces falling from above. Where the ice cone had stood, there was a further retreat of about three chains, and at the outflow the outlet rock was exposed for one chain, or fifty links more, than in February. On reaching the eastern bank on the route to Camp 2, the general shrinkage was most noticeable. Just below the point at which we left the ice was a creek we named Arch Creek. It descended into a deep gorge, with a rock wall of two hundred feet on the northern bank, and perhaps one hundred feet on the southern. In the mouth of this there was a large isolated rock, the Eye Tooth, estimated one hundred and twenty feet in height. The ice which flowed past the end of the gorge was pressing against the outer side of the rock, and in November 1893 was almost on a level with the top. On our second visit it proved to have retreated on the south bank of the creek for forty feet, and continuing along the glacier up the valley there was a general shrinkage of ten or fifteen feet while below camp two large holes appeared in the ice, showing the rock and indicating a still further retreat in the future. On crossing over to camp three at Cape Defiance, we found that though the ice had pushed its way a little further into the mouth of the creek, yet it was not banked up so high as formerly at the cape itself. When pitching camp three the previous summer, it will perhaps be remembered, we built a flat platform of large stones in the bottom of the V-shaped valley formed by the moraine and hillside. This was still there, but the ice having retired and caused a subsidence of the lateral moraine, the platform had fallen over, or capsized, without breaking, towards the ice, and instead of being level was now lying at an angle of twenty degrees. Opposite Cape Defiance, above point E, the ice had banked up higher at another rocky point, but the gain there did not exceed the loss at the cape. This may perhaps be merely a temporary upheaval and in the course of a few months the pendulum may swing again, and the ice rise at the cape, and fall on the other side. It may only be due to the oscillation or lurching of the glacier in its downward path. The temporary advance behind the sentinel, observed in February, followed by retreat, and the retreat by the barren rock, followed by advance in the winter, may also be due to the same cause. Though all this had taken place in one winter, it is possible that the glacier is only passing through a temporary period of retreat, and that a great part of it is due to a mild season and heavy floods, causing large pieces to break off frequently. If the ice recedes at the same rate every year, the glacier will, in a comparatively short time, become of second-rate importance. I anticipate from the manner in which the Fox Glacier is holding its own, that though no future advance will recover the ground lost, by present retreat, yet it will to some extent repair the damage or at least remain stationary. But it is evident that this glacier is slowly but surely losing ground. There are many interesting problems to solve in this valley, but they would require considerable attention during prolonged and frequent visits. It is little use for a man to go there in the way I have been. He must have leisure and be able to afford good instruments and plenty of time. Here he would have a glacier at an exceptionally low altitude, obviously flowing at great speed over rocky obstacles, giving good opportunities of solving some of the most interesting questions of glacier motion, such as the comparative rate of the surface and lower ice, its effects on rocks, and the variation in position of the great waves or undulations on the glacier. 
the speed at which this vast body of ice flows would give more pronounced and satisfactory results than could be obtained on one of the slow-moving glaciers of other districts there are also many questions as to the position and extent of the ancient glaciers to be determined or at least the solution is to be looked for in the old moraine hills on the flats and in the old ice lines in the valleys the fact of there being four different ice lines or terraces shows i presume that the old glaciers had four separate periods of rest and possibly advance during their general retreat how long these various periods were and the distances between them have to be discovered and the franz joseph or fox glacier may offer evidence on these points to any one who is competent to collect and apply it the terraces of bare ice-worn rock without vegetation followed by another with vegetation of a certain age and yet another with trees of greater age may go far to help in the solution i shall always regret that i have not the means at my command to enable me to make a collection of data on the subject of the great ancient glaciers the answer to these problems is not to be found only in the low country but in remote valleys to which as yet no one but douglas and i have been and the most interesting one of all namely the valley which gives the key to the old glacier which formed the cascade moraine was explored by douglas and since then only visited by prospectors End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of pioneer work in the alps of new zealand by arthur paul harper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter twelve karangarua river with douglas again topography foota camp floods castles flat bark camp twain gorge alone regina creek on september twenty third mr ned gibb who has a store on the waikukupa river came up to the waiho on a visit to the diggers and i returned with him we had a long talk about golf for he was a caddy at st andrews before he came to new zealand and hadn't had a good pitch about the old game for nearly thirty years after staying a night at his house on the beach i continued my journey to gillespie's on my horse with my goods and chattels in two saddlebags strapped one on each side when a few miles from gillespie's i discovered that one of my rolls had fallen off so started back at a gallop to pick it up because i had been riding close to the surf on the hard sand and was afraid that it would have gone out to sea after going about a quarter of a mile i saw it floating fifty yards out beyond the first line of breakers and travelling up the coast with a strong current which sets up the beach while the tide is going out before i could go in after it the bag sank and i had to sorrowfully jog on to gillespie's without it a week later the mailman coming down the beach picked up the contents at various places scattered over the sand some miles north of where i dropped it as generally happens on these occasions the most precious things were lost namely two pounds of boot nails tobacco seven pounds and two dozen quarter plates exposed on the franz joseph glacier on reaching gillespie's i found a note from douglas to say that he was at mr scott's farm on the karangarua river flats i therefore went on crossing cook river and saltwater creek one of the worst and most treacherous fords on the beach and reached scott's that evening here i found that douglas had been suffering greatly from rheumatism all the winter and though not really fit for it he was determined to come up the river at any rate as far as he could for some time previous to this the government were desirous of finding a pass by which a road or track for tourists could be taken from the hermitage to the west coast this pass they required to be quote, free of snow and ice for three months in the year end quote. it was well known from the eastern side of the divide that no such pass existed from the head of the godley to mount sefton and douglas had been up the copeland river a branch of the karangarua in eighteen ninety two and reported no such pass as required up that river our work therefore in the season of eighteen ninety three to ninety four had been the exploration of the waiho and cook rivers to prove that there was no route such as they required by those valleys and also to get reconnaissance surveys of this new country completed now however we had instructions to explore the karangarua and its branches and report on the possibility of a track up this river over some saddle into the landsborough river and down that valley to a pass found by mr t n broderick from lake ohall on the eastern side of the divide 
This would, I pointed out, be a very roundabout route, but as it would combine both a report on the route and an exploration of the only district in South Westland still unexplored, the authorities decided to have it inspected. The Karangarua had been traversed up to Castle's Flat, a large open basin in the hills, twelve miles from Scott's house, or sixteen from the sea. Beyond that point, the Twain and the main branch were both unexplored. Six miles above Scott's, the Copeland River, draining the divide from Mount Stokes, La Perouse, to Mount Sefton, joins the Karangarua, and on Castle's Flat, the Twain, draining the divide from Mount Sefton to Mount Monga, flows into the main stream, which takes its rise from the northern end of the Hooker Range. The topography of this district is rather puzzling and somewhat difficult to describe clearly. The dividing range, after leaving Stokes, 10,101 feet, runs practically south for four miles, and then circles round in a southwesterly direction for another four miles, passing the footstool, 9,097 feet, Sefton, 10,359 feet, to Mount Brunner. From there it takes a southerly direction to Mount Monga, 8,335 feet, a distance of some two or three miles, and again strikes in a southwesterly direction to the Host Pass, upwards of 40 miles away. From Stokes, the Copeland Range branches off and divides Cook River from the Copeland River, and from Mount Sefton, the Karangarua Range runs slightly north of west for 12 miles, dividing the latter river from the Twain River. From Mount Monga, the Hooker Range runs for five miles to Mount Howitt, due west, separating the Macaro Glacier from the head of the Twain River, and then turns in a southwesterly direction, continuing for about 30 miles, parallel with the dividing range, and with it enclosing the Landsborough River, which flows from the Carroll Glacier. From Mount Howitt, a short, precipitous offshoot runs parallel to the Karangarua River for about seven miles, and divides the Twain River from the Karangarua main stream, which takes its rise from just under Mount Howitt, and has a saddle leading into the Macaro Glacier. The Hooker Range, therefore, has cut off the Karangarua Valley from the dividing range. The so-called main branch is really not the most important, and is, strictly speaking, a tributary of the Twain River. But when the lower part of the valley was traversed, these branches received their names, and they have been retained for convenience. In referring to them, I shall consider the Twain River the tributary of the so-called main branch. On the 1st of October, we left Scott's house and camped some four miles above the farm, at the point where the river leaves the hills. We pitched the batwing in some tutu scrub on a sheltered flat, and remained there for a week. From here we blazed or cleared a track up the river for three miles, one mile above the inflow of the Copeland River, where we built a futa and made our second camp. A futa is a small shelter of bark and canvas, raised off the ground, in which to leave provisions and stores sheltered from the weather, wekas, and rats. The one we made here was four feet off the ground, with a floor of seven feet by four feet, and five feet from floor to roof. It was built of raw to bark and saplings, and will in all probability stand for several years. Two of us put it up in half a day. On Saturday the 6th, three horses arrived, by previous arrangement from Scott's at Camp 1, and we packed enough provisions in the footer to last us for five months, with the help of birds. Above this camp our hard work began, for we had to carry everything up on our shoulders, this being the last point to which a horse could go. The stores we brought up to the futa were flour, soda and acid, side of bacon, rice, sugar, dry figs, chocolate, cocoa, tea, jam, treacle, a splendid thing for this work, oatmeal, a few tins of sardines and meat, two half axes, two bill hooks, a small frying pan for baking, three billies of different sizes, three mugs, two plates, a tin prospecting dish, ice axes, ropes, instruments, cameras, plates, two bat wings, three flies, biscuits, soap, candles, matches, tobacco, alpine climbing lantern, salt and pepper. The provisions were supposed to last for five months, with the help of birds. The luxuries, such as cooking utensils and bat wing, would only be taken to the head of the Karangarua. Any further work in the Landsborough or Twain we intended to do in light order, that is, with a fly only, and the stores. The half-axes were necessary in case we had to cut a tree down to spar the river or a bad creek. The bill-hooks were for blazing a track. By way of amusement I had Cook's Voyages, Milton's Poems, and Pliny's Letters, 
in pocket editions, also two packs of cards. The latter I found most useful when alone, as I played patience, or had a game of cribbage, right hand against left, by way of a change. It is curious how one generally has a tendency to cheat in favor of the left hand. A blanket each and one spare one between us, sewing materials and boot nails, must be added to the above list, and in order to remind myself that I was a civilized being, and only temporarily a savage, I took a toothbrush and a comb. For medicinal purposes, Douglas carried, quote, painkiller, end quote, and pills, and I, quote, eucalyptus, end quote, depending on natural medicines for other things. Since I had last seen Douglas, he had lost Betsy. She had been with him on a spur of Ryan's Peak, and disappeared in a fog on their way down, no doubt having fallen into a fissure in the rocks, or perhaps over a precipice. Douglas had written asking me to bring him down a, quote, various pup, end quote. The greater the variety of breed, the better. But curious as it may seem, I could not get one at a reasonable price. It is really remarkable how valuable mongrel pups become when you want one. A dog which the owner was on the point of drowning yesterday is worth two pounds today, when you make inquiries. Consequently, no sale results. The owner loses a sure half-sovereign, and the puppy probably loses his life in a week or two by running against a stray bullet, which happens to be traveling near him. Douglas, however, had picked up a pretty little dog, and we decided to name him after the first bird he found. Soon after we started, he discovered a nest of blue duck's eggs, so we dubbed him Eggs. It was fortunate that we did not wait for him to catch a bird, for he turned out to be quite useless, and only caught one weka some six months later. Poor dog! It was not his fault, even then, because the weka charged him, and he had to kill it. A week of wet weather followed, during which we staged three or four loads, about two miles up the river, and left them under a piece of canvas. The place we named Poison Camp, being the scene of one of Douglas's many extraordinary escapes, when working alone as he used to do. A few years before, he had started up the river by himself to explore it, and got as far as this camp with his stores. From here, he went on to Castle's Flat to reconnoiter the route, and returned in the evening, intending to move his camp next day. He had with him a tin or two of sardines, and one of them poisoned him. He was ten days there by himself, very ill, and sometimes delirious, finding himself more than once away in the bush without any recollection of leaving the batwing. It was also raining a great deal, so besides sickness, he was nearly all the time wet. No one but Douglas would have survived such an experience. This misfortune, of course, terminated his exploration of the river, for a time at any rate. On reaching Scott's again, he opened another tin and gave the cat some of its contents, to see if they were the cause of his illness. The cat only ate one or two of the sardines, and died a few hours afterwards, which was fairly good proof of the exceptional quality of those fish. The return of his rheumatism compelled Douglas to go back to Scott's on the 17th and in three days a young fellow arrived at the camp to go on up the river with me. While alone at the foot of camp, I had the opportunity of seeing how quickly a Westland River can rise in heavy rain. On the 19th, having been up the river with another load, I turned in early in the evening, and at 9 p.m. the weather was quite clear. I do not know when it clouded over or began to rain, but at 2 a.m. I woke up, finding the bat wing flooded by three or four inches of water in which I was lying. I got up and drained the camp with my ice axe, and could hear the river, which was about twenty yards away, coming down in a regular flood. At five a.m. I went across to the bank, and marked the height of the water, which in the early morning light looked splendid. There was not a boulder to be seen, and branches of trees were careering down in the swirling yellow water. Opposite the camp, there were some stones ten or fifteen feet in height, and they were invisible. Turning in again soon, I slept till ten o'clock, and on waking found the sun shining brightly, and the river already lower. I afterwards measured the rise and fall of the water carefully, and found that between the commencement of the rain and five a.m., say five hours, the river had risen fifteen feet, and by four p.m. had fallen eight feet, regaining its normal level some time during that night. The great rise is due to the course of the river being narrow at this point. From the Futa to Poison Camp was, for a west coast river, good going, but beyond there was half a mile of very rough boulder travelling, not nearly so bad as Cook River, but quite rough enough. It is purely a matter of comparison, 
as to good and bad travelling on these rivers. I have no doubt, whatever, that anyone who had no previous experience of a west coast river would consider the piece from the footer to poison camp decidedly rough going, as the stones are from one to three feet in diameter, and the half mile above the latter place he would only be able to describe in superlatives, for Cook River would either be left undescribed or the description would be unparliamentary. When I speak of good travelling, I mean only good compared with the average river going. It is really quite bad enough. On the 22nd, my new companion and I went up with heavy loads. I had 80 pounds, and he had 65 pounds, to Castle's Flat, and when doing the last half mile were very sorry we had not made two trips with light loads, instead of one with heavy. At four o'clock we reached a knoll or hillock, covered with rata trees, three-quarters of a mile above the lower end of the flat, and here we camped, about twelve miles from Scott's. Two more days were spent in staging up some of the stores left at Poison Camp, and by the twenty-fifth we had made everything snug at Camp Three, putting a bark wall six feet high in a circle of twelve feet in diameter right round the camp. As we intended to make this our base of operations, and as it would probably be left standing for three months, we made it very substantial, pitching a large seven-by-four-foot batwing and ten-by-twelve-foot fly inside the bark wall. Bark Camp, or Camp Three, though airy, was the most palatial residence we ever had the whole time we were out, but of course it was only our head camp, and unless wet weather compelled us to stay in it, we should be away for weeks at a time. As it turned out, however, I had nearly two months on this flat, as will be seen later. Similar flats are to be found on many of the West Coast rivers, luckily for the unfortunate explorer. It would be heartbreaking work to toil up narrow, boulder-filled valleys or rock-bound gorges, without some hope of a piece of easy going, and the relief of a mile of flat walking after several days of crawling and climbing over large boulders is beyond belief. One feels quite a new man, and after leaving the flat, ready to attack the inevitable gorge with renewed vigor. One or two rivers, however, are without any easy traveling for their whole length. Cook's, for instance, was more or less all rough, and certainly had no flat, and Douglas speaks of the Turnbull River further south, which he explored, as having sixteen miles of gorges, out of a total length of eighteen miles. A small flat of half a mile on such a river would make the whole difference to the exploration, for instead of being a grind, it would be a pleasure. Like most of these basins in the heart of the ranges, Castle's Flat is the center of some magnificent scenery. In fact, from the time the low country is left behind, until we come back down the rivers, notes of admiration are necessary, so far as scenery is concerned. It is a level patch of ground surrounded on all sides by high rocky mountains, which form an oval basin one and one half mile long and one mile wide. About the middle of this basin was Queen's Knoll, at the foot of which we made Bark Camp. It is a matter for scientific men to decide how these flats are formed, but here I believe a lake existed at one time. The surrounding mountains are steep and bare, with rocky slopes incapable of holding any glacial deposits rising for some thousands of feet very abruptly out of the flat. At the southern end, or the corner, as I named it, the main branch of the Karangarua comes in, through a rocky gorge and over high cataracts. On the eastern side, the Twain River and Regina Creek flow through similar great gorges and cataracts, divided by a high conical hill of rock, and join the main river about the middle of the flat, the former about a quarter of a mile above Bark Camp, and the latter immediately opposite, across the stream. At the northern or lower end of the basin is a large bar of glacial deposit, augmented probably by slips from the hills. This bar has, perhaps, caused the river to flow more slowly, and consequently to deposit a large amount of small gravel, gradually filling up the valley to its present level, and at the same time spreading out to a greater breadth. But I think it is more probable that a lake has existed here in the past for there are numerous terraces on the flat, showing that it was once considerably higher, and it has since been cut down by the river. The bar of old moraine at the lower end would have caused the river to back up and form a lake, while the constant denudation of the hills in the upper valley, and the numerous slips of which there is evidence, would by slow degrees have filled up the valley, until the lake ceased to exist. The channel through the bar has then, in the course of time, become lower, and allowed the river to reach its present level, leaving the flat high and dry, 
and also the above-mentioned terraces. In the middle of the river opposite Bark Camp was an island which, with Queen's Knoll, is nearly all that remains of an old terminal moraine. They are both composed of great boulders, heaped up promiscuously, amongst which large rata trees are growing. The island had a single kiwi on it, so I named it Crusoe's Island. The rest of the flat was lightly timbered and covered with very dense scrub, of ten to twenty feet in height, until some of the higher terraces were reached, and these had older and larger trees on them. There were also three or four small pakahis, or spaces of open grass, perfectly useless for pastoral purposes, but pleasant to walk over after emerging from the scrub. The general level of the flat was 680 feet above the sea. My present plan was to follow the Duane to its source and cross over a saddle into the McCarrow Glacier and Landsborough River, follow that valley down to Broderick's Pass, some 25 miles or more, and then, returning to the McCarrow Glacier, find my way over into the Karangarua main branch and follow it down to Castle's Flat again. This would probably have taken two months, if the weather was not unusually bad. On the 25th, we forded the main branch, just above the inflow of the Twain River, and blazed our way with billhooks along the south bank of the latter stream, hoping to find a route through the decidedly ugly-looking gorge. In this we were disappointed, for after a day's hard cutting, we emerged from the stunted vegetation onto a sheer smooth face of rock, rising hundreds of feet out of the water, without any chance of a route. As we got further into the gorge, the hillsides became steeper, and the vegetation more stunted, and at last it was evident that we should hardly be able to traverse this side with heavy loads, though we might do it in our present unburdened condition. Telling my mate to await my return, I went on to see what the place looked like round a rocky point ahead. The sides now were practically sheer precipices, and I was clinging on to the scrub entirely. Having at last come to the end of the vegetation and reached the bare rock, I could see that no man could get along on this bank, for the rock was smooth and perpendicular, throwing out short buttresses of rounded water or ice-worn rock, affording no more hold than the side of a house. Hearing the water a long way below, I caught hold of a shrub above with one hand and leant out to look at the river, and it proved to be two or three hundred feet below me. To show how precarious a hold the vegetation has in such places, my weight caused the whole mass of scrub for twenty feet above me to leave the rock and stand out a foot or two in a perfect network of roots, with apparently no hold on the cliff for twenty feet, where there was evidently a crevice or a ledge. It can be imagined that I did not waste many minutes getting back to where the side was sloping less steeply, having no wish to further test the strength of the roots. I believe if the roots were cut along the ledge above, that the whole network of vegetation would fall outwards like a curtain for twenty or thirty feet. The gorge, now that we could see into it, was truly magnificent. The south bank rose nearly sheer, that is, precipice after precipice, with ledges here and there for some three thousand feet, straight out of the water. In places, great overhanging rocks frowned down upon us from above, and seemed to be ready to topple forward as we climbed along beneath them. At one point the rocks leaned over to such an extent that a stone would have fallen one thousand feet without touching the cliff once on its descent. The opposite side sloped back at an angle of nearly forty degrees, and was covered with luxuriant bush. Through this gorge the river descends some five hundred feet, in about three hundred yards, over large boulders, up to and over forty feet in diameter, which are jammed in magnificent confusion into the narrow rock-walled channel, forming a cataract to which I have never seen its equal. Above the cataract the gorge continues with its stupendous walls for over a mile and a half, and then the valley takes a bend away southwards toward the glaciers of Mount Sefton. This river descends 2,500 feet in three and one-quarter miles through two gorges. It was quite evident that the north side would be the best to attempt, for it was not by any means so precipitous, and had trees growing on it which would afford shelter and firewood. The twain was without doubt going to give us some trouble, and it would be by no means easy to take our loads through so bad a gorge. My companion thought it very grand, and was surprised when I told him that of course we should take our camp through if possible. He seemed to have some idea that we should make no further attempt to get up the river. The next day, sending him down to the foota for a load, I traversed some of the larger creeks below the flat, and brought up a fifty of flour in the evening. 
and on the 27th we both went to poison camp for the rest of our stores there, spending the afternoon in completing our shelter and bathing in a fine pool close to camp. During these two days my mate was somewhat silent, and occasionally sounding me as to the idea of going on into such bad-looking country. He couldn't understand how we were to find our way if no one had been in front of us, nor could I excite his enthusiasm by saying we were the first two in that country. I was hardly surprised, therefore, on Sunday morning the 28th, to find that he was going back to Scots before it was too late. I remonstrated with him, but all to no purpose. It's too lonesome, he said up here. I'm going back. As long as we are together, I suggested, it would not be lonesome. Oh, well, he answered. I'm not the sort that likes being stuck away up here anyhow. I like seeing life. I admit the idea of anyone seeing life in South Westland or anywhere else on the coast amused me somewhat, and as I knew he had never been away from the district, I said, Good heavens, man, where can you see life? At Gillespie's, of course, was the answer, given with considerable surprise at my ignorance. A somewhat feeble description of Gillespie's has already been given, so it may be imagined the idea of seeing life there was rather too funny to be taken seriously, and I fear that the guffaw which greeted his answer hurt his feelings. He left me alone in my glory that morning, taking down a message to Douglas to try and send someone else, and also some letters to post. The fact of the matter is that he was frightened of the rough work, like most other young fellows of the district, for, except south of the Host River, it is hardly possible to induce a man to go into the ranges. This has been Douglas's experience in the past, and is the reason why he did so much of his work alone. The weather up to this point had been rather finer than usual, but on the 28th it began to rain, and continued for a week without interruption, confining me to my shelter with little to do. Luckily I had brought up a flute, but something went wrong with the works, and the lower three notes refused to make any sound. There are not many tunes which one can play on three notes only, so beyond several hours of vigorous puffing to get more than a wheeze out of the low notes, the instrument afforded little amusement but a great deal of hard work. Heavy rain has its advantages in the ranges, as well as its drawbacks, for, when amongst the great rock peaks, the waterfalls are wonderfully fine. One day during this week, I counted no less than eighty-six good falls within half a mile of camp, varying from two thousand to three thousand feet in height, those coming down the great rock slopes of Mount McGloin being magnificent. This peak is situated on the southern side of the flat, and its bare rock slopes rise to a very steep angle, and in places sheer precipices, to a height of over five thousand feet above the flat. The weather cleared on Guy Fawkes Day, but as the rain had been cold and snow had fallen on the tops, the river was not high. Deciding, therefore, to explore the creek I had named Regina, I forded across from the camp to Crusoe's Island, a distance of eighty yards, and again from there to the other side, another fifty yards, finding the stream just strong and deep enough to necessitate the use of a pole. Regina Creek joined the river at this point, after descending through a boulder-filled gorge, and over a grand cataract of seven hundred feet, in a quarter of a mile. Not only is the course of the creek filled with large stones, but the hillsides, far up into the bush, present as rough a piece of travelling as I have seen since Cook's River the year before. It took no less than an hour to go the last six chains at the top of the cataract through large forest trees growing on and amongst boulders of all sizes, up to sixty feet in height and two hundred feet in girth. Sometimes deep gaps between these would be spanned by an old tree trunk, over which was the only way to cross, and very uncanny it was. One never could be sure that the bridge would bear, and the hole in most cases had water at the bottom, in semi-darkness, in which I could see my reflection as I passed over. At the top of the cataract the valley, as usual, opened out into a broad basin, lined with bold precipitous mountains, at the bottom of which the stream flowed through a small flat. A mile above the great cataract a smaller one was met with, beyond which the valley again opened out, and showed another rock-bound basin, with a small secondary glacier at its head, which supplies the creek. Though Regina Creek is on a smaller scale than the Twain Gorge, it has very grand scenery, and would eclipse many favorite resorts in Europe with its attractions. I should, however, prefer not to be the unfortunate man who has to engineer a track or road through those terrible boulders which have to be negotiated before the upper valley is reached. At the foot of the cataract 
there was another instance of that reasoning power of trees already referred to on an isolated boulder in the stream two large rata trees were growing and evidently found their rocky home too small to give sufficient nourishment no doubt when young saplings they had quite a good time but now they were full-grown trees and had to find better means of support the rock was ten yards from the bank and one of the trees had sent out a sucker or arm across the intervening river bed to the richer soil of the terrace the sucker was about the thickness of a man's arm and had twined round two stones about one and two feet in diameter on its way to the bank on reaching the terrace it had lifted itself from the river bed and raised with it the two stones which were to be seen quite four feet from the ground firmly held in its clutches the sixth and seventh were wet again and the river rose too high to allow me to ford it safely so instead of going to the twain gorge i carried the traverse up to the foot of the karangarua cataracts and went for a quarter of a mile along a very bad and precipitous hillside into the gorge it is not so fine as that of the twain but if the latter was not so close the karangarua cataract and gorge would strike anyone as a very grand piece of scenery the only result of this day's work is summed up in my diary quote, the gorge will give us some trouble end quote. and it did i now had nine more wet days during which the river rose eight feet even on the flat a real old man flood it must have been very high in the narrow valley by the futa and in the gorge it was of course impossible to go up to see the cataracts but they must have been a wonderful sight i could see great jets of water shooting up now and then above the high trees from the regina gorge on sunday eighteenth it cleared up again so i took a day off and hung everything out to dry and had a general washing of clothes i do not mean to convey the impression that this was the first time i had washed clothes since leaving scots that very tiresome operation was carried out every week when possible and as we never took a change except an extra shirt and pair of socks we had to sit in our blankets while washing and drying the garments on the nineteenth i went down to the futa for a fifty of flour and some odds and ends the long spells of wet weather had been rather dismal for me by myself for it had put all the creeks in flood and prevented any work it also cut me off from scots because no one could have come up in the present state of the rivers however the last three notes of the flute had not yet given forth any music therefore until they did i had some employment and if by any chance i had made them sound then there were reasonable hopes of a tune sooner or later stores also were plentiful and so far there had been no lack of birds so i was able to spend considerable time in preparing meals of several courses and in more time in discussing them for i generally had to cook the next course while eating the one just cooked the menu on a wet evening when there was plenty of food and time to cook it may be interesting potage weka kiwi and pick a pick a fern poisson sardine à l'ouïe entrée sardine à la carangarua relève boiled kiwi légume boiled picky picky fern roti roast weka entremet flapjack and jam savory sardines on toast dessert one dry fig sometimes the birds would be roasted on the end of a stick and on sundays we allowed ourselves one onion if we had any by way of a treat we tried on these swell occasions to imagine our tea was brown sherry of course only in wet weather did i try to raise a smile on my own face by going through the formality of a long dinner in fine weather there was too much work to do and when any one was with me time did not pass quite so slowly sardine a la carangarua is a rather good dish cut a thin strip of bacon roll a sardine in it fry for a few minutes and as the cookery books say serve hot on toast end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Thirteen Karangarua River Continued. Bad Weather. Twain Gorge. A Maori Arrives. Douglas Returns. Karangarua Gorge. Lame Duck Camp. Douglas Again Ill. Head of the River. A Lonely Christmas allowing the river another day to reach its proper level i left camp on the twenty-first and fording just opposite 
went up the north bank of the Twain to see if a route was practicable on that side. These rivers are glacier streams, and very cold indeed to ford. After a long crossing, like the one opposite camp, which was about eighty yards of actual wading, the cold made one's legs sting painfully. Though we had to ford creeks or river four days in a week during the work in the lower part of the valley, we never really got used to it, and always found the stinging cold very disagreeable for a few minutes. The weather, at this period of our work, was so bad that it would be monotonous to record my daily experiences. The 20th and 24th were wet days, but very cold, so the river did not rise enough to prevent a certain amount of work. On the 21st and 23rd, I made trips into the Twain Gorge, trying first a high level and then a low level route along the north bank, and in each case was stopped by a bluff or terrace of smooth ice-worn rock, some 200 feet high facing up the valley and running obliquely from the top of the range down to the water's edge. A party of three could no doubt find a route through the gorge with help of a rope, but for one man it proved too difficult to make it practicable. About seven miles along the Karangarua range from Mount Sefton is Mount Glorious, which sends off a spur in a southwesterly direction for about four miles. The spur divides the Twain Gorge from the valley of Regina Creek and is the only offshoot worth mentioning from the Karangarua range on either side. The slopes of the range and the spur are smooth, and lie at an angle of thirty-five degrees, showing here and there large patches of ice-worn rock and high bluffs. The soil all along this slope is very thin, and has in many places slipped away, leaving the bare rock. On the north bank of the Twain Gorge, the vegetation, consisting of large trees, has only a foot or two of soil in which to grow. In several places in the bush, there are large bare faces of rock, and the trees seem to have formed a network of roots to help one another to stand. The high-level route took me a mile into the gorge, at a height of 1,700 feet above the water, and the lower one I could only follow a very short distance, as the above-mentioned rocky terraces, which ran down obliquely to the course of the river, kept forcing me up before a way over them could be found. The view of the gorge from the furthest point I reached was very imposing. The opposite side, which had proved too much for us before my companion left me, showed a bare face of perpendicular grey rock of hundreds, nay thousands, of feet, with a ledge or shelf here and there on which some trees found a precarious foothold. Several springs of water were to be seen, shooting out from the rock face for a foot or two, and then, dropping downwards, would be lost in space, only reaching the bottom as spray. During the second attempt, I was fortunate enough to witness the effect of a thunderstorm while in the gorge, an experience I should have been very sorry to miss. The echo and re-echo of the thunder from those vast precipices, combined with the mists swirling across their faces, can never be forgotten, and the effect was intensified and appeared far grander, because I was alone. How feeble one's pen feels when attempting to describe such wondrous scenery as this. The Twain Gorge, with its awful grandeur, Regina Creek, with its beauty of a quieter sort, and the Karangarua Gorge, with its fantastic surroundings, require a form of word painting entirely beyond my powers. Again, the charm of a quiet evening after a storm, in the midst of such wet and boisterous weather as we had at Bark Camp, has to be experienced before it can be realized. When sitting out on the river bed below the camp, listening to the murmur of the river, the weird cry of the cacas flying across the valley, the clear note of the tui, and more familiar sound of the English blackbird, which has found its way into these solitudes, and when looking at the picture of blue ice water flowing round a dark bush-covered island, backed up by a gloomy gorge, through which the ice-capped summits of the higher mountains could be seen, lighted up with a warm glow by the last rays of the sun, I used to feel that in spite of my loneliness I was to be envied. The absolute peace and restfulness of such an evening is better appreciated after a hard day of climbing and rough work, alone, forcing one's way into an unknown gorge, or after a long spell of stormy weather, such as there had been lately, when the very elements seemed determined to hinder one's attempt to push ahead. While smoking in quiet contentment, and looking at the magnificent surroundings, one would mentally picture other similar evenings, by no means uncommon, in other localities, and wonder why one never got tired of such things. I suppose a true lover of nature never does tire. On the evening of the 26th, I was sitting in my ragged clothes over the fire, 
and having been unable to make those three lower notes sound on the flute, I decided to have some songs. While singing, as only a man can sing when he knows there is no one within miles of him, I was startled, in the middle of a verse, by seeing a yellow three-legged dog and then a Maori emerge from the darkness into the firelight. Both were evidently very much amused at the picture they had seen before I noticed them. This proved to be Ruera Timahi, or Bill, as he is more commonly called, and he told me that, quote, Charlie, Charlie Douglas, he say you fell go up find Harper, end quote. Having given him some cocoa, which he said, make Perry good tea, I asked him if he had any letters or papers for me, to which he replied, like all Maoris, oh yes, plenty time. However, I was not prepared to wait so long, having been without news for nearly six weeks, so I unrolled his load, and to my delight, found a great roll of papers. Graphic, Detroit Free Press, Strand Magazine, Weekly Times, Pall Mall Budget, and Sketch, etc., also letters, and some fresh meat and onions. Douglas was coming up in a day or two, as he was better, and Bill was to go on with us in order to help him with his load, as he was determined to reach the head of the river. On the twenty-ninth Douglas arrived, not really fit for work, but as plucky as usual, and we had seven days of uninterrupted rain by way of showing him what it had been doing for the past month. However, the budget of papers gave us plenty to read, and the time did not hang heavily on our hands. At last, on the 6th of December, the weather cleared, having been exceptionally bad for six weeks, and raining on thirty-three days out of forty. From this date till the end of summer, the season was as good as we could wish, and fully made up for the previous long spell of rain. Since it was not possible to take our impedimenta through the Twain Gorge from Castle's Flat, it was quite evident that, in order to explore its headwaters, we should have to find a route into the valley by some saddle higher up the Karangarua Valley. In 1893, Messrs. Fife and Graham had crossed from the Muller Glacier into the Landsborough Valley, and finding that river too rough to follow, had gone up the McCarroll Glacier and dropped over a saddle onto a small flat, but had not gone any further, returning to the Muller Glacier again. From the photographs and their description, we knew that they had reached the head of the Twain Valley, but had not attempted to follow it down. We therefore decided to push on up the Karangarua River and get into the Landsborough Valley, and from thence into the Twain River, and coming down it, join on the traverse at or near the point I had reached from Bark Camp. Another route equally good would have been up Regina Creek and over the spur into the Twain Valley, but there was no advantage in taking that line. Sending the Maori down to Scots with a mail and to get a few odds and ends, I went up the river and crossing Niblick and Tui Creeks, cleared a track through the gorge. It was a difficult and rough piece of work, taking three days to reach the more open valley above, a distance of three miles, of which only one and one half mile required a track, and was responsible for the whole three days' work. The route, after mounting a steep broken slope, overgrown with tangled vegetation, had to be taken along above the walls of the gorge, some two hundred feet above the river, and below high overhanging cliffs of black rock. The two or three creeks which flowed into the river here dropped over the precipices in fine cascades, having pools between each fall, and wherever the water flowed the bare rock had been exposed, showing only two feet of soil on the surface. There will be terribly large landslips some day in this district, because the hillsides are very steep, and the soil has little hold. In the pools between the waterfalls we found some cockabullies, a small fish of three or four inches in length, unhealthy, black-looking beasts with bullet heads. One pool had five or six in it, and was between two waterfalls of about fifty feet, so it was rather hard to understand how they had got there. Douglas tells me he has seen these fish climbing up the wet moss at the edge of a waterfall, evidently finding sufficient moisture from the spray. They are also to be seen on the move in very heavy rain. Some of these same fish have been found in the water at the bottom of a deep shaft on the Ross Goldfield. The river descends 1,100 feet in this gorge, over two large cataracts, which have been formed in the same manner as those in the other branches, by great boulders filling up the narrow rock-bound channel and preventing the water from cutting the valley floor down to a lower level. Above the upper cataract, the valley opens out and has, on one bank, the south, a terrace of hard and ice rock, 300 feet high, at the top of the cataract which gradually becomes lower as the floor of the valley rises, until it ceases altogether, some two miles further up the river. 
the opposite bank has a series of rocky bluffs with good shingle beaches and small grass flats between them and affords good travelling on december eleventh the maori and i took a light camp up to a spot i had chosen a quarter of a mile above the gorge on the twelfth i sent him back to bark camp to bring another load and help douglas over the track while i pushed on up the river to reconnoitre the camp we were now in was rather an awkward place to be caught without stores in bad weather for in order to return to our head camp it was necessary to ford the river which ran deep against the rocky side and cross two large creeks had the river risen a foot it would have been impossible to cross and one's retreat would be cut off we therefore called this camp the rat trap about a mile and a half above here the river has cut a most fantastic gorge through the rock the sides are some forty feet high and in places approach to within three feet of one another while the water has worn a very tortuous channel for itself the banks resemble two pieces of rock which have been roughly dovetailed and not placed quite into position between these walls the water is twenty feet deep in places and very clear on emerging from the gorge there is a small flat two thousand eighty three feet above sea level which seemed a good place for the next camp and was surrounded as usual with high rock peaks from one of these a fine waterfall theodore falls descended in four leaps over rocky precipices from a height of seventeen hundred feet this flat i named lame duck flat because jack the maori's dog pursued a duck which had young ones and nearly killed himself by going over a waterfall into the gorge when a pair of ducks have a brood and danger threatens the female goes away with the young ones and the drake draws the pursuer after him in the opposite direction by pretending to have a broken wing most dogs know that it is only pretense and make no attempt to follow but poor jack gave chase and for nearly half an hour was now swimming and now running on his three legs on the river bed while the drake kept just five yards ahead of him at last the bird drew him towards the gorge and before i could prevent it jack was over a waterfall between rocky walls however i believe that dog had nine lives for he reappeared lower down grinning as usual but looking very foolish next day i went down through the big gorge to bark camp and on the following morning the fourteenth we all returned up to the rat trap camp bill and i with heavy loads on the fifteenth we moved camp again to lame duck flat and while the maori made two or three trips down to bark camp for stores i went on up the river alone with a fly leaving douglas at lame duck camp with a bat wing passing through another troublesome but beautiful rocky gorge i put up my shelter a mile and a quarter further up the river at the point where a large tributary which i named troit river joins the main stream this drains mount fetz eight thousand and ninety two feet and flows through an imposing gorge between towering mountains half a mile after the troit stream joins the river it flows through a short gorge of twenty chains at the lower end the rock sides form a great arch over the water which is twenty yards wide at this place and approach to within six feet of one another at a height of forty feet from the river an almost complete arch and sixty yards above this the two sides actually touch from below the water to fifteen feet above the river here goes down in a whirlpool on the upper side and bursts up with a furious seething and bubbling on the lower side evidently having only a narrow passage below the water line this must be a wonderful sight in a flood starting from troit river camp early on the morning of the eighteenth of december i pushed on through some bad travelling to the head of the river and climbing two thousand eight hundred feet reached the saddle five thousand six hundred and forty one feet leading into the mccarrow glacier about noon a short climb down a snow-filled couloir of three hundred feet brought me on to the glacier about a mile above the terminal face having thus proved that a practical route could be found into the landsborough valley i decided to return at once down the river to see how douglas was getting on and by dint of some pretty fast going reached lame duck camp at dark after a day of fifteen hours here i found poor douglas quite unable to attempt further work and reluctantly making up his mind to return to scott's it was very hard luck because he had explored or shared in the exploration of every river on the west coast from the wataroa to the sounds and had set his heart on reaching the head of this the last unexplored valley however he showed his usual pluck by swallowing his disappointment without grumbling and the next morning began the return valley 
sending the maori down to scott's two days journey douglas and i made a long day and were able to reach bark camp at dark as we had nothing to carry douglas was to wait here till scott sent up some men and a horse to the futa in order to help him down for he was really not able to walk much having had to be carried over the creeks and river by me the day before leaving him therefore in good quarters with instructions to the maori to bring up a load after me i returned to lame duck camp with a load of four days stores to leave at the rat trap for use on our return after finishing the twain and landsborough valleys having to fix a station on the north side of the valley the next morning i went down to coleridge creek a large tributary flowing into the river just below the dovetail gorge and draining a small patch of ice on the top of the range the hillside here is bare rock for some two thousand five hundred feet above the river varying from thirty two to thirty six degrees off which the whole surface of soil and scrub has slipped the slope was too steep and smooth to attempt in my boots so i dispensed with them and found that bare feet made the walking quite easy though the slope was rather steep in places on reaching thirteen hundred feet above the river i sat down to take bearings and was greatly amused at poor jack who had accompanied me he was looking at me in a very reproachful manner and trying his best to sit down first with his head uphill and then down but of course a slope at such an angle is not an easy seat for a quadruped though he could walk up it well enough however five hundred feet higher there was a small tarn ten yards in diameter on a shelf in the rock and here he was happy while i was making further observations going down again was rather difficult but beyond one approach to an involuntary glissade of some nine hundred feet the descent was uneventful leaving two pounds of oatmeal a tin of hare soup and one of jam under a stone at the camp for use on our return i made my way to troit river camp taking all the things up in one load while passing through some bad boulders which at two places completely bridged the river i nearly came to grief by trying to get through a hole formed by two of these monsters lying against one another on the top of a third stone the opening roughly resembled a single oriel window about four feet from the ground and narrow therefore i put one leg through and lifting my arms over my head got my shoulders through but the load proved too large and became firmly jammed owing to the position of my arms i was unable to get back or to reach the sheath knife in my belt to cut the shoulder straps and i could not use my legs for they were both off the ground after some three or four minutes of pulling and straining which seemed more like an hour i began to fear that i should never get out but one more desperate effort was successful and i extricated myself with numb arms and pretty well exhausted by the brief struggle there is no excuse for this mishap it was gross carelessness on my part to risk the chance of sticking in a place like this when alone the proper plan and the one which i generally adopted was to get through the opening first and pull the load after me instead of endeavouring to pass with the load strapped on my back like all other dangers it was a case of familiarity breeds contempt from troit river camp i tried to follow the troit stream down through the gorge but without success as it was rock-walled with cliffs of three hundred and four hundred feet in height and full of waterfalls to go up this branch would require a climb through the scrub over the spur forming one side of the gorge i therefore made a climb on the north bank of the karangarua and was able to overlook and make all necessary observations for mapping the troit basin mount fetz eight thousand and ninety two feet with a small hanging glacier lies at the head of this stream and shows a magnificent rock face of some four thousand eight hundred feet cut up in ridges buttresses and couloirs to the right about two miles up from the junction a low saddle shows where jacobs makawiho river takes its rise which flows behind mount mcgloin and reaches the sea eight miles south of the karangarua on christmas eve i took half my impedimenta up to a small flat two thousand eight hundred and three feet under the saddle at the head of the river a journey of a mile and a half taking a good three hours and leaving them in shelter returned to camp that evening where i had some observations to make not particularly relishing the idea of spending christmas under a sixty-pound load and over bad travelling i decided not to begin festivities until my shelter was rigged up on christmas flat leaving troit river therefore at five a m i reached that flat at eight o'clock and had the camp pitched two hours later and having brought up a small piece of suet and a few raisins on purpose for christmas i made a pudding and had it boiling by noon when everything was snug i shook hands with myself wished myself a merry christmas and offered my congratulations on reaching the head of the river i then produced the flute and sitting on a stone near the fire so that i could watch the pudding struck up a christmas tune or two 
but as the three lower notes were still silent the only part of the tune that my audience could hear was the part that happened to wander amongst the upper three notes my audience which by the way consisted of two wekas i killed after the concert was over and prepared them for my evening meal it has since been insinuated by kind friends that the audience probably died from the effect of the performance the best mode of roasting a weka is to make an opening at the back of his neck and clean him then get a stone about an inch in diameter and having made it red hot put it inside the bird and passing a stick through his body stand him in front of the fire to roast when the bird is cooked in about half an hour we plant the stick in the ground and proceed to carve slices off as it stands up in front of us my christmas dinner consisted of five courses namely weka's liver and heart on toast roast weka one onion deviled weka's leg plum duff three dry figs and i ventured to say that though i had no brandy for the pudding and the suet was too old and made it taste tallowy i spent as happy a christmas as most people but i confess that a man must have succeeded in reaching the head of his river after some pretty rough work before he can really appreciate a duff made of bad suet after a short smoking concert in the evening i hung the remains of my socks on a branch over my head and turned in but i suppose there were too many holes in them for in the morning the contents panned out very poorly a little hoarfrost only it must be admitted that a man must be rather a maniac before he can enjoy these sorts of discomforts bill one day after he had rejoined me put on my cap by mistake and found it too large so he said you fell got perry tick head possibly he was right and that may account for my enjoying this solitary christmas just after i had hung up my socks and turned in i heard a shout down the flat and on going out found that the maori had arrived having slept at lame duck camp the previous night we therefore put up a shelter for him by the light of the fire near my own quarters and made another brew of tea before finally turning into our blankets he had a good load of stores and a grand budget of papers and letters for me which i spent the next day in reading for owing to my custom of going about barefooted when anywhere near camp i had burned my instep and was unable to put on a boot or do any work a most tantalizing invitation was amongst the letters from mannering who writing in november stated that a large party were to be at the hermitage for christmas and were anxious for me to find some passover and join them this would probably be easy to do had my companion been any good on hills but he proved to be of little use so i dared not attempt a high pass with him and had to give up the idea the newspapers contained news of the czar's death by cable and were more than six weeks old when they reached me the maori made a first-rate companion and his english was amusing it was rather like chinese pidgin english he always said i me for i and you fell for you he could not pronounce the letter r but always substituted l and many other little peculiarities forgetting birds he was capital and if any were near he and his dog jack always found them the only drawback was that he was painfully slow and no good on hills or rocks so i had always to leave him in or about camp and do the high work alone sometimes a risky performance one thing which interested me greatly when he arrived was that he said you fell son of white man i asked him what white man he meant oh de white man long time ago he come down with terapuhi by this of course i knew he was referring to my father who was the first white man to cross from the east coast to the west in eighteen fifty seven he went over at the head of the Hurunui river with a few maoris and explored the coast down to the host river as it is now called but having written very little about it the expedition had been practically forgotten bill however told me he was a little boy and that his father took him up to okarito to see the white man and the old chief now living at jacob's river told him when he was coming up to join me that i had the same name and might be the son of the white man on the twenty seventh i sent the maori up to a rock on the saddle to leave a load of stores under it and leaving camp at four thirty a m myself i made an ascent of mount howitt and another peak cairn four between the karangarua and twain rivers by six a m i had topped the range some three thousand feet above camp and after spending an hour or more observing and photographing i went along the arete between the mccaro glacier and twain river to the latter point seven thousand four hundred feet above sea level the climb was uninteresting from a gymnastic point of view but being alone i had to be careful of the large snow cornice on the arete 
and of some rather steep ice. Also, on the return in the usual fog about noon, it was difficult to see my way down the steep and rotten rocks for a short distance. But topographically, the view was grand. The Twain Valley could be seen over 3,500 feet below, walled in on the left by immense cliffs, which extended from the source down to the gorge by Castle's Flat. Across the valley the Karangarua Range, with Mount Sefton at its head, could be followed down to the junction of the Copeland River. On it is the large ice field of the Douglas Glacier coming off Mount Sefton, and then a high offshoot, which I named Pioneer Peak, divides the Douglas from the neve of another fine primary glacier, the snout of which was seen sweeping down a tributary valley into the Twain. This, which I christened the Horace Walker, with some smaller glaciers, which I named Wilkes, Pilkington, Morse, Fitzgerald and Fife, drains into the Twain River, and accounted for the volume of water seen at Castle's Flat. To the south, the Landsborough Valley could be traced from the Macaro for some thirty miles, and peak after peak of the Dividing Range towered up, like the teeth of a huge saw, carrying a little snow and ice, but forming some fine rocky summits. The 28th we spent on the saddle, completing the observations for the Karangarua Valley, and also bringing stores to place under shelter of a rock up there in order that on our return from the Landsborough to the Twain, we should replenish our supplies as we passed up the McCarrow Glacier under the saddle, thus avoiding a descent to Christmas Flat. The ascent to the saddle was an easy one, up an open rough creek for 1,200 feet, and then 1,000 feet or so over open grass slopes covered with large erratic boulders. The creek ran at the foot of a huge precipice of ice-worn rock, the top of which was rather higher than the actual saddle. Beginning at nothing just above the saddle, this cliff became higher as the ground sloped down to the flat, until it was 1,500 feet high. A waterfall, the Sisters, came over this in one leap of 800 feet, halfway up the slope to the saddle, and formed one of the sources of the Karangarua. Four other creeks flowed down in various directions, and joined on Christmas Flat, draining small snowfields on the hilltops. Very stunted and thick mountain vegetation grows for 600 feet, on the lower slopes of the hills, and in places on the flat itself the scrub was fairly thick, and grew to a height of ten or fifteen feet. The greater part was, however, open grass and young scrub, which we burnt. We also fired one or two spurs. At the head of a valley, if the weather was dry enough, we generally fired the scrub, but rarely got a good burn. It never grows again when burnt, and thus, in the future, a few open spaces may delight the heart of any other maniac who tempts providence by following in our footsteps. End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 14 Landsborough River. Into Landsborough Valley. New Year's Day. No birds. Starvation rations. A forced march. Hast Pass Track, Return Up River, Broderick's Pass, Back at Christmas Flat. It is always best to camp, if possible, near some scrub, in case of bad weather, for it would be very wretched to be without a fire for two or three days. From the Karangarua Saddle, it seemed that four hours good travelling would be necessary before the first scrub was reached, which meant about seven hours from Christmas Flat. Accordingly, on the morning of December 29th, I sent Bill away at six o'clock, and followed three hours later with light loads. Unfortunately, instead of two hours to the top of the pass, he took nearly seven, finding the climb, quote, too tipi, steep, peri luff, end quote. Consequently, instead of leaving the pass at 11 a.m. for our descent into the Landsborough, we did not leave until 2 p.m. On looking over the stores on the saddle, I saw that we should be running very close to short rations, unless we had luck, for there was a distance of at least twenty-five miles to go down this valley, and after the return there was the Twain Valley to do. The trip down the Landsborough and back, I calculated, would take at least eight and perhaps ten days, but as no one had been into the valley since it was first explored some years ago by Douglas, we expected to find an unlimited supply of cockpos. It would not therefore be necessary to take much food. These birds, as stated previously, live only in districts covered with birch forests, and the whole of the country from the Landsborough to Jackson's Bay, and even further, is birch country. About five years before, a party, of which Mr. Muller, then chief surveyor of Westland, was a member, 
led by Douglas, made the first exploration of the Landsborough River by the north bank. During that trip, the whole party of six had only carried a little flour and limbed entirely on kakapos, which were so plentiful that Douglas says they, quote, had to tie the dog up. She caught too many, end quote. The river is unfordable from the moment it leaves the glacier, and hitherto no one had traversed the south bank, so I had every reason to anticipate no trouble in finding birds, for we should be the first to travel down that side. Accordingly, I decided to leave as much food as possible under the rock on the pass for our two days' work on the Twain River. We therefore took seven or eight pounds of flour, some tea, sugar, a little chocolate, cocoa, and treacle, enough to last us with luck and birds for ten days. In fact, so certain was I that we should have no lack of birds, that I almost decided to take nothing but tea and sugar. In addition to the food, we had camera, instruments, a blanket each, field books, ice axe, eight by ten fly, a small axe in case it was necessary to cut a tree for sparring a creek, the homemade light loads of about thirty-five pounds. The Maori no likey, the climb down the snow couloir, but the rope eased his mind greatly, and when he got onto the glacier below, down which we had to go for nearly a mile, the poor old fellow was very unhappy. He pushed one foot gingerly along in front, and brought the other up to it, and so on, having grave doubts whether the ice would bear his weight. However, in a quarter of an hour he felt happier, and when he got onto the surface moraine, he, like he more, and stepped out like a man, being quite convinced that he was off the glacier. I here unroped, and was pushing ahead, when I heard an exclamation behind me, and found that the Maori had stepped on a piece of thinly covered ice, with the usual result of sitting down with more speed than grace. On turning round to get up, he saw that he was still on ice, and with a most ludicrous expression of surprise, he said, Golly, I me tink no more ice. When we ultimately reached the lateral moraine, he was still very doubtful and fully expected to find ice cropping up somewhere. I do not know if anyone has had a Maori on a glacier before, but imagine this was the first time that one has been on alpine rope, and, considering all the superstitions concerning the ranges that Maoris have, I consider Bill showed uncommon pluck in facing it as he did. I could see he was in a regular funk, but he showed his courage by setting his teeth and not betraying it, except by his color, which was yellow. Below the glacier for two miles, the river runs between high terraces in a channel cut down through old moranic and other deposits, there being a large grassy plateau, 4,300 feet above sea level, on each side of and 300 feet above the river. This is covered with large erratic blocks, and is cut through by the Spence Creek at one mile, and Leblanc at two miles, which flow from the glaciers of those names between high terraces. These two glaciers are both near the river, and the streams from them are black with slaty silt, and rush down over large boulders at a great pace. Both gave us considerable trouble to ford, and the latter especially being really dangerous enough to be unpleasant for we had to step on to large stones a foot under water, between which the stream was deep, and owing to the dirtiness of the water we could only find the next stone by feeling with the ice axe. The stream was running like a mill race, which made it the more difficult to make a sure step. Here at 3,520 feet we found the first burnable scrub, and made a rough shelter with a piece of canvas under a rock about sunset having taken thirteen hours over a journey, which could have been done in seven hours, had my companion been any good in rough country. The Maori worked like a man and did his best, but owing to short-sightedness was painfully slow. It was fortunate that I had made a point of reaching a place where we could have a fire, for it rained for two days, but we were not at all happy, as there was only room for one of us to sit up at a time. However, Bill was peri tiffy, stiff, so he was not sorry to lie down most of the day. The reason of this discomfort was that we could not find any poles to pitch our fly properly. Had we been in a better place for timber, we should have been happy enough. On the moraine of the Mercero, I had killed a kia with a stone, but had seen no other birds. Consequently, our flour began to dwindle rapidly, and by the end of the second day we had little left, though limiting ourselves to a small slice of bread per meal and a stick of chocolate. On the last day of 1894, my diary states that, quote, This is a poor game when caught in bad weather under a stone where only one can sit upright at a time. We can neither return nor go on. Everything is in flood. 
when limited to two small slices of bread a day and no birds, the fun begins. Bill and I have been talking of our first kakapo all day, and are beginning to doubt if any birds exist. Menu for the last dinner of 1894. Quote, a conversation about kakapo and wekas, dessert, a slice of bread and cup of cocoa, end quote. This shelter we named Musk Camp, because here our only firewood was mountain musk, as it is generally called. It is a scrub of the myrtle species of a sage green color, and grows to a height of four feet. The leaves, when burnt, smell very like incense, and are not unpleasant to mix with tobacco. It only grows above the 2,500 feet level, a pure alpine shrub. There is another kind, of which I have only found two specimens, with a large leaf and slightly different scent when burned. This I call the incense plant, and found it in the Douglas River, near the Margent Glacier. Also one specimen in the Waiho country. To burn a little of either shrub in a room has a delightful effect, and is much liked by those who have had it brought to them from the ranges. The former is found on both sides of the divide. January 1st, 1895 was dull, but the rain had stopped, therefore we pushed on down the valley. A few miles below Musk Camp on the northern side, a fine glacier sweeps down off Fett's Peak, right into the valley to 2,950 feet above the sea, having its terminal face for a quarter of a mile washed by the Landsborough River. About four miles from the camp, a very large creek from the Arthur Glacier on the dividing range, descends in a series of cascades through a fine gorge, and then bursts out over great stones into the river. We arrived here at 3 p.m. and found it uncrossable, so built a shelter for the night, hoping it would be lower next morning. We dined off one skinny kia and a quarter of a scone each. Bill felt peri sore inside, making knee peri weak, but it could not be helped. A rough day after breakfasting off a conversation concerning wekas is not easy work and to have to finish it with only a mouthful or two of kia and bread is trying, to say the least of it. About sunset, we heard wekas, kiwis, and kakapos within fifty yards of us, across the river. The Landsborough has a mighty volume of water in it, and rushes down at a great pace in its rapid descent. It is unfordable from the glacier for thirty miles of its course. It spreads out onto large flats at this point, and could be forded by a horse, if such an animal could by any chance be brought to the spot. Consequently, unable to cross the river, we had to sit and listen to the birds quite close to us, and hunger in silence like Tantalus. Quote, Egens benigne semper dapis, end quote. On the morning of the second, thanks to a hard frost in the night, the creek was four inches lower and enabled us to cross by jumping from boulder to boulder. Most risky work, but accomplished without accident. A mile or so below camp I saw a weasel in the bush close to the river, which explained the absence of birds on this bank. Weasels have been turned out over the Haast Pass by some officious person, and have found their way all along the south bank of the valley, but so far have not been able to cross to the other side. Soon after midday we reached the first piece of flat travelling, and continued to meet with small flats between a mile or two of rough travelling, until the evening when we camped opposite Mount Dechen some eight miles from, and 1,283 below, the last camp. We got no birds, and were pretty well done up for want of food, having to breakfast and dine off the same conversation, and a small slice of bread, about four by three inches. Next day we again moved on, and travelled till 6 p.m., over extensive flats of open Pakihi land in the birch forest, with short stretches of bad travelling in between, and one or two nasty creeks to cross. At 5 p.m. we found three wekas, and as soon as we came to a good place to camp, in about an hour, we kindled a fire and had the three birds roasting on three sticks, and with three hot stones inside them. In half an hour they were standing up in the ground in front of us, while we cut, sliced, and devoured them. In another half hour three sticks were all that remained, Jack, the Maori, and myself, having given a very good account of ourselves. A weka is equal to a commoner garden fowl so three birds between two men is a fair meal. I had very little to guide me as to the whereabouts of the pass I was to report on, and did not know where it could be on this side of the range, but from instructions received before starting up the Karangarua, I imagined that it would be near this camp. However, Bill's boots were quite worn out, and even had we plenty of stores, it would be folly, if not cruelty, to make him attempt a return journey in such footgear. 
I therefore decided to push on down the river next day. About fifteen miles below here, the Host River joins the Landsborough River, flowing from the Host Pass, eighteen hundred feet, over which a transinsular horse track has been formed for some years from the west coast to Otago. On the beach at the mouth of the river, twenty-five miles from the junction of the Host, is a store, and the same distance up the valley track from the junction would take us to Stewart's sheep station in Otago. Mr. Stewart had been the first to cross the pass, on which Sir Julius von Host afterwards placed his own name, in the early sixties, and put cattle on the very extensive flats which are found at the junction of the two rivers, three hundred feet. To reach these flats and the track which skirts them involve fifteen miles of rough travelling, interspersed with long stretches of level going. I decided to go on as far as this track, and then either to go over to Stewart's station or down to the store on the beach, in order to get Bill a pair of boots. I had heard, however, that part of the track was to be repaired during the summer, and was in hopes that we should find a road party at work, who could perhaps satisfy our wants, and save the extra twenty-five miles. I intended to go alone, but Bill did not care about being left in these solitudes, so we both set out on the following morning, leaving everything in our shelter. The travelling seemed easy, unburdened as we were, but a climb of eleven hundred feet over a bluff was trying to us after our long fast. This is a good illustration of the trouble caused by bluffs on the rivers, where a spur descends toward the stream and ends abruptly in a cliff, at the foot of which the river flows deep and swift. After ascending and descending eleven 1 hundred feet through bush, we emerged five or six hundred yards only from the point at which the climb commenced, or two hours' work, and little over a quarter of a mile gained. It was dark before we reached the great flats, at the junction of the two branches, but we managed to find an old hut near the track, the remains of one of Stuart's mustering fares, in which to pass the night. At eight o'clock next morning we were wakened by a blast of dynamite, about two miles away, and knew that for the present our spell of short commons was over, for a road party was at work on the track. Leaving Bill to follow, I hurried across the wide flats and riverbed, forded the host stream, and in an hour was near the road camp. Here I met one of the men, and he would not believe that I had come down the Landsborough, terra incognita to them, but thought I had come over the pass from Otago. However, he soon saw something was wrong when he took me along to his tent and saw me sampling a cold stew, for I could not wait until he had cooked a meal. When I explained that the two of us had travelled forty miles down the river, and had only two kias, three wekas, and a little flour between us, in eight days, he said that accounted for my eating a, quote, cold, greasy old stew, end quote. It also accounted for a good hot meal, which he had ready for me when the stew was finished. I knew Mr. Nightingale, the overseer, so went on and found him, but he did not know me at first in my rags, and with four months' growth of hair and beard, nor did I recognize myself when he gave me a looking-glass. The Maori turned up in due course and ate twelve large cold doughboys, suet dumplings, while waiting for something to be cooked, and like me, he, quote, feel peri gland, quite full, end quote. We spent four days in this hospitable camp, and were fed up like two turkeys being prepared for Christmas. It will perhaps be remembered that Bill brought me some old newspapers when he rejoined me at Christmas camp, after having taken word down to Scots about Douglas. Consequently, as there were then rumors of complications in Europe resulting from the Tsar's death, I was anxious to know whether I belonged to England or Russia. The men at this camp, being on the track, were able to get a mail every fortnight, so they were only two weeks behind in their news, and had papers of more than a month later date than those the Maori had brought me. During our first evening, sitting round the campfire, I asked what the news there was, and was told by one man that Jackson and Corbett, or some such names, had decided not to fight. So I said, Is there no other news? and was informed that there had been no news for months. However, on looking at the papers, I found them full of the mail reports of the Tsar's death, not short cable messages and reassuring cables that the general peace was not likely to be broken. This had apparently not been worthy to be called news, as compared with a possible prize fight. This, however, is the same all the world over, for I recollect, when quite a small boy, going to England via San Francisco in 1878, the last news from Europe as we left Auckland said that, quote, war inevitable, 
between England and Russia, end quote. On arriving at Honolulu, then, the only port of call, a Russian man-of-war lay near the entrance of the harbour, and my parents were most anxious to have the latest news. When the pilot came on board, there was such a rush that my father could not get near to him, so waiting until he got an opportunity, he said to one of the passengers, Well, what news? To which the passenger replied, Confound it, his name begins with a P. The rush had not been to ascertain whether war was declared, or whether the man of war was going to cut off the mails but only to settle a sweepstake on the pilot's name. It was most amusing to see Jack's behavior here. When we arrived, he was as well behaved as possible, and did not attempt to steal, but he was only waiting to find out which camp we were going to patronize. As soon as we had established ourselves in Mr. Nightingale's camp, he began to thieve right and left from the other tents. It is owing to this failing that he lost his leg some months previously. Bill caught us plenty of eels and wekas, which were plentiful here, and prevented the double strain of our presence from affecting the stores of our hosts, to any extent, before the packer came up from the beach with more provisions. The Maori's boots were quite worn out by the time he reached Nightingale's camp, and we had a good deal of trouble to get another pair. The packer arrived in due course, and returned to the beach for a few stores for us, but could get no boots so bill had to content himself with two old odd ones belonging to some of the men having got these we started on our return trip up the river on january eleventh with a few pounds of rice and flour the maori took two days over the journey as i wanted him to catch some birds on one of the lower flats but i pushed on and reached camp the same evening doing fifteen miles in eleven hours which is pretty fast going the camp was one thousand and three feet above sea level and seven hundred and fifty above the junction of the Haast. In eighteen ninety, Messrs. T. N. Broderick and Sladden crossed from Lake Ohau in Canterbury over a low saddle of four thousand three hundred feet, and descending to the Landsborough River, stayed a night in the valley and returned to the Canterbury side of the range. As already stated, I did not quite know where to look for this saddle, but on going up the river to the camp. I crossed three open grassy flats absolutely alive with rabbits, and then a fourth and fifth without any of these vermin. The small flat on which we were camping was the sixth, and this had literally thousands of rabbits, the ground being as bare as a barrack yard. When we reached this open space and came out of the trees onto the grass, it seemed as if the whole surface of the ground turned to somersault in sections, In such countless numbers were the rabbits diving into their burrows. The ground looked honeycombed. The fact that there were two grassy flats free of bunnies between this point and number three flat showed that they had not come up the river. Therefore, they must have come from the eastern side of the range via some low pass, probably Broderick's. Having left the pea rifle at Christmas camp, and owing to the extreme shyness of the rabbits, we could not have got any had we wanted them, and the three wekas caught on our arrival here on the way down had saved us the trouble of a possibly useless hunt. There were none on the smaller flats above this point. The next day was too foggy to attempt an examination of the high country, so I hunted wekas and snared two or three, while the Maori, who arrived in the afternoon, brought four kakapos and two wekas, a heavy load. The thirteenth was a wet day, but we got nine more wekas a little farther down the river, and spent the fourteenth, which was again wet, in smoking them for future use. Having lost our salt, we had to depend on smoke. We now had enough birds to last us till we reached the stores on the pass. The 15th, I spent in ascending Broderick's saddle, which, as I anticipated, was above the camp, and the rabbits must have come over by that route. I also looked at another low pass more to the east, but neither was of much use for a road, being too precipitous. The view into Canterbury was very extensive, and I gloated over the grand, open, grassy hills for some time, before descending again to the terrible west coast scrub and forest. There was, however, no reason to complain of the bush in the Landsborough Valley, because, like all other country covered with birch forest, it is fairly easy to travel in. The bush is fairly open, with fine timber, clean-limbed trees of five and six feet in diameter, and little undergrowth, and when the grass line is reached at 3,500 feet, there is none of the usual mountain scrub, the trees merely become smaller until they cease. From near Broderick's Pass, I took several photographs, which were unfortunately spoiled by damp, like so many others this year. 
I had to leave the boxes of exposed plates sometimes for weeks, under a stone or other shelter, to be picked up on our final return to habitation, and the damp marked them rather badly. A grand view of the Hooker Range was to be seen from this spur. Mount Hooker, 8,644 feet, across the valley with its great horn of rock, rising out of fine ice fields, looked as if it would give some trouble to ascend. The pure white ice dome of Dechen, 8,500 feet, some ten miles up the river, has a snow line of under 5,000 feet, and except for innumerable berkshrunds, would make an easy climb. Dechen is, I think, one of the most beautiful snow domes or cones I have seen. It rises at a gentle angle which gradually becomes steeper at the top, and in its perfect symmetry almost reminded one of the volcanic cone of Taranaki, 8,260 feet, in the North Island, though the actual cone only began at 4,000 feet. Beyond Dechen, the rocky pinnacles of Strachan, 8,359 feet, rose out of sundry fine secondary glaciers, and a little further away, Fett's Peak, 8,092 feet, showed his fine rock peak, an equally hard nut to crack as his neighbor from a climbing point of view. Miles away to the northeast, I picked up the footstool, Sefton, and Dwarf, which lie at the head of this and the Karangarua River. Four thousand feet below, the valley could be followed for twenty miles, the first few miles having a broad flat bottom with many large pakihis or grass flats, through which the river twisted here and there, flowing close against the base of a spur, dividing the different flats. Gradually, however, as the eye wandered up, the valley became narrower, till at last no flat places appeared, but each spur descended right into the river and formed difficult and rough traveling. On the immediate right hand, Mount Mackenzie, over 8,000 feet, raised his rocky summit, with hardly a vestige of snow or ice, a miniature Matterhorn, which, with his shattered rocks, would be a troublesome fellow to climb on this side. At 3 p.m. a storm of rain wetted me to the skin and compelled me to descend to camp. On the way down, Jack caught me two cockapos, but the climbing being beyond his powers by the route I took, he went home by the line we ascended, so no further birds could be found. On the 16th we went up to our third camp on the down journey, and had reached a point halfway to Arthur Creek the next day, when more rain compelled us to camp. Here I made another ascent on the 18th, but beyond obtaining some observations and photographs, there was little worth mentioning. We had two empty treacle tins, which we brought in case of necessity, and these we filled with the oil of the cockapoo. This liquid is of a light straw color, and though not as good as weka oil, is very nourishing. As I knew we should find ourselves short of flour, till we reached the rat trap. On our return down the Karangarua, I saved all the oil I could to mix with the flour. It is a good, though not very palatable, way to economize. The Maori was very happy now, for we had unlimited food, having not yet finished the smoked wekas, and because I got one or sometimes two kakapo on each ascent. They seemed to have been all above the bush line at this time of year, which accounted to some extent for our bad luck on the way down the river. One evening, sitting over the fire, Bill mentioned a man whom he had seen at the road camp, and said, He never poor. Never poor, I replied. What do you mean? He always fat, never poor. Of course he's always fat, you old fool, I said. When once a man is fat, he generally remains so. To Maori, said Bill, he's sometimes poor, sometimes fat. He no tucker, he peri poor, but belly full, he peri fat, same as to hen. He meant by this that a Maori gets in good and bad condition in the same way as a weka does, according to his food. I laughed at the notion at the moment, but on looking at my companion next day, I saw that his dusky old face was now shining like a copper kettle, and he looked like a well-groomed horse, in a ragged cover, certainly, but still well-groomed. A fortnight previously, he cut a sorrowful figure and looked in wretchedly poor condition after the short spell of starvation. I have since been told that the change is quite noticeable amongst Maoris, according to their food. The 19th was cold and wet. The snow was quite low down, but we pushed on in order to cross Arthur Creek before a warm wind came and caused it to flood, and getting over far more easily than before, we made a rough shelter opposite Fett's Glacier in a storm of sleet and rain. On the following morning, there was little improvement, and we traveled on and crossed the LeBlanc stream, also very low owing to the cold and bivouacked out on the grassy plateau, 3,993 feet, 
about a mile and a half below the McCarrow Glacier, reaching there about five o'clock. The day had cleared during the afternoon, and the peaks began to show, as the clouds slowly disappeared, and by sunset they were all visible, looking glorious in their coating of fresh snow. This was a wild-looking sight for a bivouac, a great grassy basin of two miles by one, with great erratic blocks scattered over it, surrounded on three sides by towering rock and ice-capped peaks, down which avalanches would thunder every half-hour, making poor Bill start and look nervously round over his shoulder, for he never got over his fear of the avalanche thunder. While from a hillock behind we could see miles down the gradually darkening valley of the Landsborough, in descending which, three weeks before, we had had such a bad time. As the darkness closed in, we gathered some stunted vegetation, which grew in tufts here and there, a few inches high, and coaxed the billy until it boiled, and sitting down, watched the last three of the smoked wekas being cooked. They had to be all cooked that evening, as Bill informed me. They were a bit long, i.e. high, but they were none the worse for that, luckily, as we always had good appetites. As usual, when we trusted to the weather being fine, and put up no shelter, it began to rain as soon as we had rolled into our blankets, and with equal cussedness, no sooner had we put the fly up on a rope between the ice axes than it stopped again, and the stars shone out. The Maori explained this by saying, He come, he see over de hill, he say, Golly, two men no camp, he lane, he see again, he say, Demfell have camp, he stop. We were therefore able to use the canvas as an extra blanket after all. Bill's boots were again nearly done for, so instead of going directly into the Twain River, we returned on the 21st over the Karangarua Pass to Christmas Flat, taking some of the stores from the depot on the saddle. It was hardly worth while spending three or four days in going down to Castle's Flat for more stores, though we only had bare provision for a week left. It may have been foolish to risk another starve in the Twain Valley, but I venture to say that most persons would have acted as I did and risked it, instead of going down and up that awful river again. This is one of the occasions on which I cursed my fate at having to do such hard work with only one man, and I am afraid I sometimes wished those who were responsible could have had a few of our experiences before refusing us a third member of our party. However, the twain was still in front of us, so we could not afford to waste time. Accordingly, we only spent a day and a half at Christmas Flat to allow Bill to make himself some Maori sandals, or parara, out of flax. These do not last long, but are capital footgear for ordinary riverbed or other traveling, one pair a day being about the average. On sharp stones, however, as will be seen, they are soon cut to pieces, and three pairs will only do a day's work. Bill was convinced that three pairs would be sufficient for the Twain River, so he made five and left two at the camp when we started on the following day. I spent my day off in washing and generally mending my rags, which hardly resembled clothes, and making a few extra observations, in order that no time need be wasted when we came back out of the Twain River. The geology of this district forms an interesting study, and I greatly regretted my ignorance on that subject. Of course, we brought in hand specimens every day, which we looked upon with little favor when they increased to several pounds in weight, for though a fifty-pound load weighs fifty pounds, I am sure it is heavier if there are twenty pounds of stones in place of twenty pounds of food. These specimens, which have been collected for years by Douglas, and during the last two years by me, are from every valley and almost every range of the southern Alps, on the western slopes, from the Waiho River to Jackson's Bay. They are all in the Hokitika Survey Office, labeled and classified according to their locality, with a dip and strike of the rocks noted on each one a most valuable collection, which should enable a geologist to do good work. When these will be made use of, I do not know, but only hope they will not die the death of most things, which find their way into a public office. Generally speaking, the main dividing range of the Southern Alps is composed of a reddish sandstone, and a great deal of slate. In fact, the prevailing rock is slate, at most of the places I have crossed. The outer ranges are schist and gneiss, the junction of the two formations is generally near the divide. In the district at the south of Mount Sefton, however, the slate formation appears to extend from the dwarf across to the Hooker Range, and to continue along it for some twenty miles, where it again crosses onto the dividing range. 
the latter seems to be of schist formation from the dwarf to near Broderick's Pass, and then again runs into the slate formation. The Landsborough River, down to this point, follows the junction of the two formations, the valley having schist on the east and slate on the west side. About Broderick's Pass, the river, however, leaves the schist formation and has cut through the slate and, sweeping round, has found its way to the sea on the west coast. This would lead one to suppose that the Hooker Range is the original dividing range, and that the water of the ancient glacier found its way eastwards. Of course, it requires a geologist to decide this point, and many other interesting points, but at present no geologist has been into the West Coast Ranges. A great deal that has been written on the subject is pure guesswork, and in some cases quite incorrect. End of chapter 14